We're coming to you live from Southern California where the big event is about to start. I'm on the red carpet and anyone who's anyone is here as well. It's the first time I've walked the red carpet to a race. NASCAR on Fox. All the stars are here tonight and everyone is hoping to leave a winner. Hey, I want to be a cameraman. Oh, there's Dale Earnhardt Jr. Ah, there's last year's winner, Carl Edwards. The big winner from last week's Daytona 500. All right, we are here on the red carpet with Jeff Gordon, Casey Kane, Jimmy Johnson, Kyle Busch, Elliot Sadler. Who are uh, these guys? All right, I've got Carl Edwards with me, and uh, you're sporting a new look, huh? Yeah, it's duck. Tell me about who you're wearing. Oh, I'm wearing a beautiful suit. Of course, Italian threads. We went with the digital camo pattern. We custom fit it. Fits real nice. That's what the ladies tend to like. Tell me how you feel about your chances for this race. Good. I'm feeling good. Always feeling good. We're pumped up about it. I think we got a shot to win this one. Love coming here to California. Beautiful, fun in the sun, and a great racetrack. Things are wrapped up here on the red carpet. It's finally time for NASCAR on Fox. Hollywood always loves a good car chase, and today you'll see the fast and the furious. NASCAR on Fox welcomes you to the Auto Club 500, presented by Quaker State. We're east of Los Angeles in Fontana, California, with cloudy skies, temperatures in the low 70s, just a slight chance of rain with the San Bernardino mountain range in the background, and the leading men will be doing their own stunts. The Hollywood Hotel and its racing routes park trackside for the second race of the season, and we're glad you're with us where America gathers every weekend for NASCAR on Fox, uh, Oscar night show with Jeff Hammond, Daryl Waltrip, Chris Mars. We, I with a slum dog and a millionaire, just like that. <laughs> hey, all right, we no, kid because man, we care. All right, he's we're not rolling. concerned about the red carpet. It's more about the two miles of asphalt here that worry us today. Yeah, last week we were restricted racing, you know. <laughs> so if we had restricted racing last week, this week we're unrestricted. I have no idea what's going to happen. It could be, like, wilder than last week because we're unrestricted. Well, let me tell you something right now, buddy. What's going on here right now, this 500-mile marathon, it can really have a big impact as far as the engines are concerned. That's the main thing right now. A lot of guys are worried about this. First 500-miler like this at 9,000 RPM, that's the big difference. Yeah. That's my boy. Worry about these motors. I don't <laughs> worry about a lot, man. A lot right of your job, I'll do mine. A lot of storylines to watch. You know, 24, great television show. In reality, in that span, 24 hours ago, Kyle Busch, he won the truck race, Camping World Truck Race Series, and after that, ran over to the Nationwide race and captured that as well. It's never been done before, so he's hoping for the historic third straight win in three national touring series all at the same track. Amazing. This guy does not seem to wear out. He's taking Bush League to a whole new level. <laughs> matter of fact, I want to be in the Bush well, Let's all go to the you Bush know, League. He's, he's 230, uh, 250 laps. He's led 238 in, the, in one day. And got a chance to make history today. Well, the thing is, right now, what's amazing to me is this kind of kid, you think about Tony Stewart, you think about Jeff Gordon, but now all of a sudden it's Kyle Busch. Week in and week out, he's the guy that you've got to beat. No matter where he straps his helmet on, you've got to consider him a potential winner. You know, Toyota often playing the villain, too, but people are warming up to his success, and he seems to be handling it uh, rather well. All right, the Daytona 500, we know rain shortened, but that didn't prevent it from becoming an instant classic. We flash back to take a look when the stars were out, both on on and off the track. An 18-year-old rookie, Joey Logano, had his debut in the 20 car, left plenty of doubt on lap 81. The youngest driver to start the Daytona 500. Tangled with another rookie, Scott Speed, and hit the wall hard. He was all right. What about the fastest car of the night? That award going to Kyle Busch in his 18. He led a race high 88 laps. Speaking of 88, it was a curious race for Dale Earnhardt Jr. Plagued with pit problems throughout the night, once missing completely, then again, the penalty for just touching the line. A curious change to serious, though, on lap 124. As Junior and Vickers battling for that lucky dog spot, the crash involving 10 cars, including Kyle Busch, who was the race leader. Matt Kenton, the move of the night, squeezing through the wreckage. And a few laps later, Harvick wins for best supporting driver as he bumps Kenseth past Elliott Sadler. The biggest impact, though, best supporting actress might have been uh, Mother Nature. The sky is bringing out the rain, but drama in the end, as Matt Kenseth is your Daytona 500 champion. Coming up, we're going to have the exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. about that wreck and the effect as we move forward. And let's talk about what you took from the Daytona 500 that we will apply today. Well, it, again, it, it, most of the drivers will say that last week doesn't count. 
as far as the whole season is concerned, it, it, it's again, it's restricted racing uh, with the restrictor plate. This is the kind of racetrack where most of the races are run on. Unrestricted, two miles, low bank, mile and a half. So the racing in most guys' minds starts today. So what you're telling me, Daryl, really you took nothing out of there except the guy who exactly. won the race. I mean, you come <laughs> in here all of a sudden. Half dollars. Exactly. Yeah. You come in here now, you're working on the car, you're making adjustments. The driver has so much more input. The crew can actually make adjustments, I think, to help the driver out a lot more here today than they could at Daytona. All right, let's bring in the guys who, along with DW, call the race, of course. Larry McReynolds, Mike Joy up on the booth. And nobody since Jeff Gordon in 97 has won the first two races of a season. So, guys, what does that tell us about how difficult it is to follow up a Daytona 500 win with another victory? Well, and back then, the second race, Chris, was at Rockingham, North Carolina, before it moved here to California. So, repeating is always, always very difficult. Now, Let's not sell the Daytona 500 short, even if it was cut at 380 miles. It's the biggest race. It's the most anticipated race. It's the race everybody wants to win. And then on Monday, everybody goes, Whew. I'm glad we're done with that for another year, Larry. And uh, along with what Jeff and Daryl said, is that why everybody says the real season starts today? Well, I'll be the first to tell you, it's always great and wonderful to come out of Daytona with a good run and build that momentum. But because you come here, and as Daryl said, the carburetor restrictor plates, we've locked them away for two or three months. The teams and the drivers, they come here feeling like they control a lot more of the destiny, their outcome. They can make their car better. They can make their car worse. And honestly, when I look at starting here today, these next three races here, Las Vegas and Atlanta, that's where I think will give us the measuring stick about who's in trouble who has work to do, and who will be contenders in 2009. Because as big as the Daytona 500 is, it's only one race of 36. So maybe, Chris, it's true. The real season starts right here. Well, and have some fun today as we get ready. This is the points racing for the championship. You know, Matt Kenseth has won this race uh, twice in California. Kind of funny how things turn out. Last year, Matt didn't win a single race. This year, all he led under green was about 20 seconds of the Daytona 500, but it was enough to last a lifetime. This is right. the biggest race of the year right here. That ain't boys. Sadler is challenged for the lead by Matt Kenseth. There is your Daytona 500 winner, Matt Kenseth. And great to have Matt Kenseth uh, down on the track with us. Uh, congratulations on the big win, Matt. And uh, any carryover for you today from last week as you get behind the wheel and get ready to go? Uh, thanks a lot. Not really. Uh, it's kind of like you guys were just talking. I mean, the season kind of begins here. Daytona is a huge event, and obviously it's a it's a huge win for us. But you have to be able to perform, uh, you know, here in Vegas and, and Atlanta and all the upcoming tracks. And we all realize that. So really, uh, when we got here Friday, we shifted our focus to uh, trying to perform here at, at Fontana and just went to work on our uh, on our car and um, you know ready for today. It's a whole new week. Matt, it's DW. I, I, I saw a side of you I don't think I've ever seen before. You're such a calm, cool guy. Never show a lot of emotion. But when that race was called and they said you'd won the Daytona 500, rain was falling, but tears were falling as well. What, what, was, in, what was going through your mind? Uh, just a lot of things, but I mean, it's just uh, such a huge win. It's been a year since we won a race at all, and um, I feel like there's been a few times through my career where uh, the guys have bought me really good speedway cars, and I didn't feel like I did the right thing at the right time and, and ever got in position to win one of them things. So it felt good to uh, have all the stars aligned and, and be able to, to make the move there right before the rain and, and for the move to actually work, and uh, of course got that, that push from Kevin. So uh, just all those things added up, and it was just, um, it was just a, a big win for us. Matt, this is Hammond, and we talked a little bit earlier this week about the whirlwind tour that you found yourself on after winning the race. I mean, you had to go back home, get some clothes to get ready to make this trek across country. I mean, you went back and forth, and you were talking about how much it kind of like wore you out. Have you finally got caught up on that rest, and, you know, are you ready to go 500 miles here? Uh, I feel really good. I'm, I'm more than ready to go 500 miles here. I could, I could run more than that. I'm more than ready to get back in the car and uh, uh, get back to business, get back to what we really love. And uh, when that's over, I'm also ready to go see my house for a few days, too. We haven't seen that uh, for about a week and a half. You know, Daytona's really long anyway. You're down there for 10 days or something like that, and then uh, not really getting to go home. Uh, you you kind of get ready for that. But uh, I am really ready for the race. I'm really uh, really excited about it. I don't, I don't think we have the best car. I don't think uh, um, we have the, the stuff right exactly to win, but we made some good adjustments, or hopefully some good adjustments last night and hopefully we'll uh, get it a little bit better so we can run with the 48 and a couple of them guys. We'll be watching the uh, 17 Roush Fenway Ford. Congrats. Thanks again, Matt. Have fun today. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate all right. it. He's all about consistency when you think that in the five years of the chase, only two drivers have been in it every year, and that's Jimmy Johnson and Matt Kenseth. Our pit reporters are standing by. I'll interview the youngest driver in today's race, 18-year-old Joey Logano. Carl Edwards has eight finishes of sixth or better on this tricky track, including the win a year ago. Why is he so good here? We'll ask him. 
Kyle Busch was impressive on Saturday, making history, winning a doubleheader. But can he run the table this weekend here in Fontana? We'll talk to KB coming up. Was he villain or victim in the Daytona saga? I'll talk to Brian Vickers. All right, thanks very much. Here's what's around the turn. Junior fired up about that wreck at Daytona. Darrell puts him on the hot seat to see if he's cooled off in an exclusive interview. Same time, Kyle Busch went from most laps to no more laps. We'll talk to Kyle about maybe making history today. You'll witness it. And what's a 14-letter word for a crew chief whose first win was in the greatest race? What about 12 letters for the driver who caught our eye last week? And then a performance from Gavin Rochdale from the visionary director who brought you Keith Urban. And find out what's going on under the track and the adventures of Digger and Friends. The award for best gas and go answer goes to, that's coming up, while strutting down the red carpet here at the Hollywood Hotel in California. It's live. It's NASCAR on Fox. Welcome back to NASCAR on Fox. Gavin Rossdale performing the hit Love Remains the Same from his debut solo album right here in SoCal. I see you standing, gravity like noon or landing. You make me want to run till I find you. Shut the world away from here. Drift to you, you're all I hear. To everything we know. Face of black. Half the time the world is ending. Truth is, I am done pretending. I never thought that I had any more to give. You're pushing me so far. Here I am without you. Drink to all that we have lost.
All right, thanks, Gavin. And we're back inside the Hollywood Hotel. You know, all of us, everyone, can help fight breast cancer. Please join Fox Sports and Susan G. Komen for the cure to help raise critically needed funds for research and development. For more information, please visit Komen.org. Well, uh, NASCAR has, of course, its Hall of Fame in Charlotte that will open next year. At least they're planning on that. And if they have a wing for vintage car owners and home run hitters, this guy will be in it. Steve Burns is with Baseball Hall of Famer Mr. October and Pace Car Driver today, Reggie Jackson. Well, Mr. October, Reggie Jackson, no stranger to racing, is here, a member of the Hall of Fame. And, but, Reggie, what exactly brings you out here to the Auto Club Speedway? Well, I got a relationship here. Um, well, the France families are, are as, as good friends as, as you can say, and then uh, Gillian Zucker that runs the racetrack, and um, Lisa France, and, and uh, Brian France talked to me. You know, through uh, Gillian, talked to me about coming out and driving a car. So it did take long for me to get excited. Um, I've been around a bunch of things in my life: World Series, and Yankees, and New York. But um, you know, driving a car on a racetrack is pretty cool. Well, five World Series championships, uh, that's very impressive in your own right. And uh, I understand you have a, a message for Mr. Chris Myers. Well, um, I, I'd really like to say that from here, you know, I get a chance to spend a little time here at the racetrack, but then I go down to, you know, see what the Yankees are doing going down there. And my guest, really, that brought me out here today was Jim Safko of Ask.com, and there's uh, ReggieJackson.com is going to be up there, up there. So go out there and take a look, ladies and gentlemen. we got some things for you to, to go to. You can find me there on Ask.com. Com. Um, do me a favor, please. Would you tell uh, Chris Myers to give me a call? <laughs> we'll do it. Thanks. <laughs> that easy, right. isn't it? Yes. Right. <laughs> right, you got better than that. I'll, I'll hit you. Hit you back at uh, ask.com. All right, Reg, you got it. Uh, NASCAR has brought us such entertaining names like Lake Speed, Iggy Katona. Bunky Blackburn, Worth McMillian, and, of course, Dick Trickle. But those are names of drivers. Here's a crew chief who, in his first cup race, has become a household name. I'm Drew Blickenster for crew chief of the number 17 Ford Fusion. That's Blickenster Fur. I'm from Decatur, Illinois, and I'm all about racing. I even married Ron Hornaday's daughter. I grew up with an athletic background. My dad was a basketball coach, and I went to Indiana University to wrestle. Last week was my first race as a cup crew chief. It happened to be the Daytona 500. We missed a huge wreck, and when the rain came, we happened to be in the right position. I felt like DW. We won the Daytona 500. We won the Daytona 500. This was my first time on TV. I don't think I did a bad job. Hammond, I'm coming for you. What if I don't really want Hammond's job? <laughs> hey, buddy, stick with what you know. Now, you got one win. You still got mm, 42 more to catch up with me. What a personality. Oh, he's, he's something really else. I mean, Very he's yeah. really, really entertaining. All right, so he's a crew chief. You know, being an owner in NASCAR can worry you thin, but for Jack Roush, it was worth it all for this win. 22 years, Jack patiently sat, and now Jeff has the book on a guy nicknamed the Cat in the Hat. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I had to take a little bit of liberties with Dr. Zeus's <laughs> Cat in the Hat. My, my favorite book, but I think that... It's the only I one think, you've read all the way well, through. Well, I, I like the pictures, too, but I think Jack's going <laughs> to like it. I really do. I hope you do. Here is a story of the Cat in the Hat. He won a lot of races, but he never won that. He tried and he tried, but he just didn't win. Not with him. Not with him. Not with him or him. Then last week he once again tried. But this time was different. Both the sky and Matt cried. So the cat in the hat finally got his 500 win. <laughs> but knowing the cat the way I do, he wants to do it again. Cute, Hammond. Cute. I know, I know. I kind of trying to keep things simple, but I had a chance to talk to Jack today, guys, and I was very impressed with the fact that he said, "Look, I've won a lot of things in my career, but winning the Daytona 500 is definitely different, and it's very, very special." But in triple, typical Jack uh, Roush fashion, now it's time to win here at yeah, California. Yeah, 75 attempts, 13 different drivers. It finally happened. This, of course, the second race of 36. The point system. Let's take a look here. Matt Kenseth, of course, the leader. His first points lead since the fall of 2006. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is all the way in 26th place at the moment. Drivers get 10 bonus points if they say nice show. So far, I haven't heard anything like that. Uh, now it's time for Digger to take center stage. Digger lives under the track with his camera, and when the head pops up, it usually means that cars are coming fast. And like everyone in Hollywood, Digger has an entourage. He also has Keith Urban on call to sing his theme song as we bring you another episode of The Adventures of Digger and Forts.com or go to DWStore.com. T-shirts, stuffed animals, something for the kids, something for yourself. Coming up as we count you down to the start of the race, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Hey, what's going on there with Matt Kenseth? The exclusive interview of the 
that Daryl has with him coming off that wreck and looking forward to today. It's the red carpet treatment here from NASCAR on Fox. The Auto Club 500 on Fox presented by Quaker State. Top it up for race day. Top it up for every day. Real durable oil. And sponsored by Viagra. By FedEx Racing, we understand that every day is race day. And by Sprint, get NASCAR Sprint Cup Mobile only from Sprint, only on the NOW Network. Time to go to California. Sunny Southern California. Let's get this West Coast party started. Jeff Gordon. California kid, Jimmy Johnson. Kevin Harvick. Robbie Gordon. Scott Speed. Casey Mears. California kid right there. Yeah. AJ Allmendinger. That's Karen Fox back here. Eight representatives from California, the leading importer and exporter of drivers for this field. 17 states, uh, three countries represented, Daryl, but a lot more than the old days of racing California drivers. Oh, yeah, I was an outsider, and I was from Kentucky. <laughs> I was but, still west. But now let me tell you, the sport used to be real regional, right, right in the North Carolina, you know, kind of vicinity. As the sport grew, the opportunity for other drivers. And the other thing, multi-car teams. We needed more drivers, so they started looking at other places rather than just right under our nose for talent. That opened the door for people from all over the country. Yeah, from Bakersfield, Kevin Harvick, and uh, one of the uh, California drivers, Anthony James Allmendinger, AJ, better than okay with a third place finish at the Daytona 500. In fact, Richard Petty Motorsports, three drivers in last week's top 10. AJ is not only a good driver, but also hoping to bring sexy back to NASCAR. Hey, what's up? I'm AJ Allmendinger, driving the number 44. I'm just here having fun, hanging out. One of my nicknames is Dinger, also known as Ding Ding. A couple other names that I can't say on TV. Not the only superstar in the family. My dog, using Marley and me. <laughs> Off the racetrack, I'm pretty simple. A little bit of mini golf. I'm trying to take up real golf on Tiger Woods. That's still working on my patience right now. So I love all different kinds of music. The alternative rock, a little hip hop, a Lincoln Park, Disturbed, Five Finger Death Punch, a little bit of 50 Cent. When nobody's listening, I'll throw in a little Justin Timberlake. You know, when I get out to the clubs, I kind of I like to get my groove on, shake it a little bit. You know, I'll throw a little bone arrow, the sprinkler, the sprinkler. The best one though is when you're the bus driver, taking everybody to school, get the oops, 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 little shift. Come on in, just the mirror, driving the bus all day long. Hey, hey, I'm down here. I'm A.J. Allmendinger. You just got to know me. I'm out. See ya. All right, so sponsored for eight uh, cup cars so far. Uh, what about his future? Well, I think right now you kind of get a pretty good idea. The guy's got a great personality. He's showing a lot of talent. He's been able to handle the pressure. But if somebody doesn't wake up and realize they need to get this kid sponsored before we lose him, somebody like the U.S. Formula One team, a lot of rumors right now flying around that he may be in line to go over there and drive in that series. And we don't need to lose him here in NASCAR because I think he's got the talent and I know he's got, the, I think, the, the, the charisma to go right along with it to make it here. He's got the dance uh, yep. like Daryl yeah, did. The Daytona, Daytona 500, 500 dance. dance. All right, two drivers uh, from California. They're, they're natives. They're favorites. Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson for today's race. They've each won here three times. Jimmy going overall for that record-breaking fourth consecutive cup championship. Jeff Gordon just trying to break a career record of 42 consecutive starts without a win. Let's check in. They're both standing by with Chris Devota. Chris, I'm sandwiched in between two of the biggest stars of the state of stars, California. So you guys are so good here. I mean, three wins each at this track. Jimmy, let's start with you. What's the secret? Uh, I think a lot of it's great equipment, and then I think the track kind of fits my style, especially as it's, as it's aging here and it's it's tougher to drive and more slick. It just just works well for us, and hopefully we can keep this Hendrick dominance going at the track. Um, 24 cars running great. The 5 is, the 88 and mine as well. Well, Jeff, let's have a little fun, too. This is kind of a Hollywood's night. I saw Gavin Rosdale, his son Kingston, has a little DuPont jacket on. That might be a future hookup for Ella. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, somebody was saying there was a, a sign that 
uh, out at the speed stage or something about uh, wanting to be my future son-in-law. <laughs> so I got a big kick out of that. Ain't going to happen. No time soon, anyway. Um, you know what? Uh, it's I love coming out to this this part of the country. Obviously, being from California, Northern California, uh, I certainly love racing in California. We've had so much success here over the years, but done it. We've done it a lot of different ways, from fuel mileage to having fast race cars. And uh, today, I'm really excited. We've got a great car, a great team with this DuPont Chevrolet, and looking forward to uh, trying to do battle with my teammate. He, he's, he's really fast and got a good starting position, and we're, uh, we're, we're going to hopefully have some fun with that. All right, we're on the red carpet, so i got to ask, who are you wearing? <laughs> I have Nomex on. Hopefully it's <laughs> fireproof or resistant, as they claim, but uh, we're an Alpine star. All right. Start six, start second. Now, a couple of great sports. Uh, you know, it's almost like a changing of the guard, in a sense, right, from Jeff to, to Jimmy, but uh, I don't think he, Jeff wants to let go just yet. Oh, I know he's not going to let go. I mean, I think he's still got a lot of fight in him, and that's the kind of thing that makes it so intriguing when you see these two guys standing around talking. You know Jeff's got to be sitting there saying, and this guy has beat my record because he's won three championships in a row, and he's coming after my number four number, so DW, something's got to give here a little bit. Well, Jimmy Johnson and Chad Knauss, that's the team, and that's what makes them successful. Jeff Gordon, he he's thinking about what am I going to do after racing right now. That's on his mind. He's thinking about his family, what his future's going to be. I think he'll have a row at Hendrick Motor, Motorsports Good. as long as he wants it. And they both start today in the uh, first three you rows. Did you say he's retiring? <laughs> Not yet. I didn't when say he was retiring. Oh. I said he's thinking about his future. Oh, okay. When you mention Which trading places retiring. in Hollywood, you think of Eddie Murphy, Dan Aykroyd, or Jennifer Aniston, Angelina Jolie. But in NASCAR, trading places, the story of Tony Stewart, his exit, and the 18-year-old Joey Logano, his entrance into the 20 car and Joe Gibbs racing. Hollywood loves a smash hit, but not so for pal Joey. Trouble front straight away, Joey Logano. That was a hard lick. There's a young man that will be glad to leave Daytona. What's that? He sounded like he was putting up. Oh, oh yeah, Joey no. Logano, 18 years old, is the youngest driver in today's race. A little rough at Daytona last week with a big crash, but third last night in the nationwide race. What can we expect from you today in the cup race? Yeah, nationwide race is a, a big confidence booster for me. I think, uh, me personally, I needed that. So, uh, Home Depot Toyota is pretty good. Uh, you know, just getting more last, more experience in these cars has uh, helped me out a lot. We've uh, actually improved lots from, from when we uh, first unloaded here at California. So, uh, just getting out there and uh, finish the race and gain some more experience. All right, good luck to you. All right, thanks, Dick. Uh, Dick Burgard's been around, uh, you know, he, he was, <laughs> don't, 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 don't go there. Don't he was, don't he was a busboy at the Last Supper. No. <laughs> All right, but uh, let's talk about Joey Logano, the younger side. Now, he's talented, Daryl, but are, are people rushing him along too fast? Well, I think I, I don't even have to answer that question. He answered it for us. He said, I'm a year ahead of time. I didn't anticipate being where I am right now. I thought I had a year in the Nationwide Series. So he answered that. But I got to tell you, after Daytona, sliced bread left Daytona a heel. Yeah, you're right about that, Daryl. But I, I, the way I look at it, just Post. like from last night, when they ran that nationwide race and he finished third, I think it's kind of like a, a major league ball player. All of a sudden you draft him, you put him in there, and it, maybe it's a little bit too quick for him. Well, they move him back down to AAA so they can get some confidence. And last night, that third place finish, a great battle with Kevin Hart. Maybe he's got the confidence coming in here today to put on a great performance. Yeah, he could have a better crew chief with Greg Zipadelli. No, he's owner, the best. And, and Joe Gibbs to help him through it. Carl Edwards, he's been known to fly his plane around to and from races. He could also be seen flying around the track in his car, the 99 car. Top 20 finish at Daytona, but when it comes to the track here in California, Carl hoping for a Hollywood rerun. Sunny Southern California. His old cousin Carl, that 99 car. He's just so dominant. Carl Edwards wins. Jack Roush, fourth straight win here at this race. Good job, Carl. Carl Edwards, the defending champion of this race. You have such a great record here, Carl. Why are you so good on this tricky track? I, it's my car and my crew. They're they're good, and um, this racetrack suits my driving style a lot. You know, it's a momentum racetrack, and you know the, the Ford engine and uh, Bob Osborne make it a lot easier too. But I think today Jimmy's the guy to beat. I'm hoping that all the setup changes that Bob made are are going to make this thing fast because it's probably the worst we've been in practice at California. You know, at Auto Club Speedway. So I got my fingers crossed. I'm hoping this is going to be a good race. Good luck, Carl. Thanks. All right, so Carl said Jimmy's the guy to beat. Uh, is he just playing uh, you know, a little possum here or what? No, I talked to Carl just a few minutes ago, and he said his car is just not quite there, but he thinks he and Osborne might be able to just her up in the race, and uh, he'll be around, I guarantee you. And I think that's the key right now. Jimmy Johnson has been really good in the practice sessions, but the ability to adjust the race car this afternoon is going to be the difference between who wins this race and who doesn't. So who do you like today? Do you guys have a pick? Uh... You know, I'm, I hope Kyle Busch 
went for history all three races just for history. But I, I'm pulling for Jeff Gordon. Okay. Uh, Jeff Gordon is. A, I think he really needs to win some races this year, and I'm pulling for him. Not me. I'm going to go with Mr. Cool himself. I'm thinking it may be that Jamie McMurray and his new, oh. uh, new old crew chief, Donnie Wingo, can pull it off. I mean, Donnie was very, very optimistic. Yeah. They got it working right now. He could be a, kind of like a dark horse. Today. That's, that's, my long, that's my long shot. Okay, that's Jimmy, long shot. Uh, We're he, not in Vegas yet. He moves inside because Brian Vickers, who was on the pole, he qualified mm-hmm. uh, having the engine change. The pole. Kyle Bush may be from oh. Vegas, uh, but the odds of him winning are in his favor every time he gets behind the wheel. He has a chance at history, as we talked about, third straight National Touring Series race in uh, just over a 24-hour span. Kyle has been golden in the Golden State. Kyle Busch for the bottom side of turn number two. He heads to the back straightaway for the final time. Kyle Busch all by himself. He dominated the truck race. He's dominating the nationwide race. I think he could sweep the weekend here in all three series. A record-setting day on Saturday for Kyle Busch. He's one of five drivers to score wins in NASCAR's top three divisions at a particular racetrack, but they've never done it all in the same weekend. You've got a great shot today. What would it mean to you to pull off big history today here in Fontana? Uh, it'd be special. You know, it's something that uh, any driver would look forward to, and for me to have the opportunity today, that's pretty awesome. So we're looking forward to it. I think our interstate batteries, Camry, is decent. Uh, it's a top 10 runner right now. If we can work on it, make it better, contend for much of the day, try to steal one there at the end, you know, that'd be pretty awesome too. So, uh, again, we're looking forward to it and living up to the challenge and living up to it, hopefully making a dream. Weather could play a big factor today. It's overcast yesterday, sunny, but he'll begin his bid for racing history from row five. Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, thanks. I think he could race in snow, sleet, whatever. I mean, like a marquee jet. He goes uh, flying around. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what, Chris? In, in this age of parity, when everything is supposed to be the same, right. what, where do you find an advantage? You find it in the driver's seat, and that's what they've got right there. Joe Gibbs and anybody that he gets in there in his truck or car, he is their big advantage. I am glad I'm in the sport at this time to be able to see this kid make history because he is exceptional. Yeah, he's fun to watch. And is he already maturing just from last year, or am I overstating what no, I've seen? No, so no, no. Far? I, th- right. I, think, I think you're right. Everything last year, I think, tempered him a little bit more about dealing with this year, and that's what's going to make him so fun to watch is the fact I believe he learned a very valuable lesson. Never underestimate your competition and always be appreciative of the way things turn out. When you get a win, it's a big win. But right now, guys like Jimmy Johnson, Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, they're gunning for this guy because they know they can't let him get out front and kind of put what they did on him last I mean, what he put on them last year. When you look at that interview he did at, after the wreck at Daytona, that tells you how much he's matured in a very short period of yeah, time. Now he wants to dominate when he gets to the chase. Uh, oh, yeah. be you a got more, him down, kick him. A, a more aggressive driver. Speaking of aggressive driving, uh, that's the story with Dale Earnhardt Jr. And we'll get the real story. Daryl Waltrip sat down with Junior, an exclusive interview about last week and looking forward to today. We're glad you're watching NASCAR on Fox. Tony Stewart in the Old Spice car, owner driver, getting ready for 16th California race. Best finish fourth so far. He's done that twice. Dale Earnhardt Jr., this will be his 15th race at California. Second, his best finish here so far. And after Matt Kenseth win, the biggest story coming out of Daytona was Dale Earnhardt Jr., that contact with Brian Vickers causing a 10-car wreck. And not to play that blame game, but most drivers think that the sport's most popular driver was really the guy at fault uh, in this, Daryl. Yeah, any time that uh, Dale Jr. makes a mistake, I- I've always known him to man up and admit it. See if you don't agree. So, uh, how's your week been? And a big miscue for Dale Earnhardt Jr. Boy, Brian Vickers, Dale Earnhardt Jr. That ain't gonna work, boys! There's been a lot of wrecks at Daytona and Talladega. None, oh, yeah. None more scrutinized than this one. Yeah. It was not a good day, but... <laughs> I've had worse days than that. We had a shot of you coming down pit road when you missed your pit box. And and it, it was like you you never even looked over. You just kept on going. I know it. What was going on? Was it I don't know, man. Anything I was anything happening? Not really. I mean I was having fun. You didn't recognize your pit board? Did I understand you say that yeah, right? Yeah, I was just coming up with an excuse to cover my butt. <laughs> I used to practice pit stops with the team, but I haven't practiced in probably three years. And this winter Tony Jr. calls me up and says, why don't you come on by and practice with the guys? And so I came out, we practiced pit stops, and that's the end of that. So, because obviously it's the wrong thing it to do. It didn't work, did yeah, it? it didn't work. Then you had the penalty uh, out of the pit box. Yeah. You can pick it up from here, but from when I, I watched you come out of the pits and I saw the raging bull, you were driving as aggressively as I have ever seen you drive. Well, first off, what's the matter with that? Nothing. 
All right. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Well, except it's out of character. It's out Just of character. A out of right. character. So that's all. You know, it, maybe it is. It's definitely out of character. So here I'm sitting there with the car to, with that I thought I could win the race with, that I should be leading the race with, if I don't make the mistakes that I made. So I'm in the hole. I'm the guy that's got to dig us out. So we had to go, you know, and it's the Daytona 500. So then you get the Vickers. Yeah, we got the Vickers, and I got a real, real good push off of two. He had to have seen this huge run I had, and I said, all right, I'll ease over slowly so he knows, you know, I'm coming. And he came down and hit me in the right front fender, and it shoved me under the line, and, and I see grass, and I turn to the right and come back up on the racetrack. The first half of that situation was his doing, and the second half was my doing. And that's when I come up there and ran into his corner panel and spun him out. Did you mean to? I didn't do it intentionally. I mean, Vickers is not an enemy of mine. We had actually been pretty good buddies up to this point. I don't want to pin any responsibility on Brian or anything like that, but but that, that wreck just don't start on its own. I was upset for... 80% of the people that went sliding down the back straightaway backwards. There's 20% of those guys, I could have cared less that they were in that wreck. Do you think the guys respect the way you drive? Most of the guys that have known me since I was a kid and know who I am respect me. The guys that haven't known me that have come into the sport in the last couple of years uh, that are a lot younger than me probably don't. They don't understand what the popularity is all about because the, the popularity and the results don't match up. They have a problem I guess with a guy having uh, that much popularity and not being able to have this, you know, the same kind of results. So, you know, that's just the way it is. If I said to you, Dale Jr., this is what I want you to do this year. I'm Rick Hendrick. I'm going to be Rick for a few minutes. I want you to take everything else that you got going on, Whiskey River, whatever, the boys at the ranch, riding the guy, I want you to put all that aside for one year and I want you to give me 100% focus yeah. on that race car and that race team. And what would you say to me? You should take a week off and come hang out with me every day for a whole week, and you'd be surprised at uh, how little distractions there are, where my mind is, if you could see where my brain is on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and what I'm thinking about and what I'm considering. Um, it's close to that. Final thought, if somebody says to you, you caused that wreck. I take responsibility for it. Sure, I came back up and hit him and, and, you know, and spun him out. I mean, that's obvious to me and obvious to the rest of the world for sure. So it's not going to affect this weekend. That's behind us. It won't affect me this week or any other week. And I can't wait to get back to Daytona. Good. And I'll be just as aggressive then as I was in the Daytona 500 if I feel like I, I need to be. I mean, aside from... Reckon Vickers in the field, I don't think I was that aggressive. I can't believe you said that. <laughs> uh, that's good. Good stuff. Yeah, he's all he's one of the most honest good. people in sports. How about how about that week? Uh, well, I'm looking, spend the week? Yeah, I found a week we were off in Atlanta right he, he there. He challenged so. you, Daryl, so yeah, you yeah. got Oh, I'm gonna go hang. Yeah. Okay. I'll hang with him. Not a yeah, bad I bet you will. All right, well, there's two sides uh, to every story. Uh, we just heard from Junior. Now let's hear from Brian Vickers. He's standing by with Chris Devota. Krista? With Brian Vickers now, and Brian, you just saw that video along with the rest of us, the uh, interview with DW and Dale Jr. It's been a full week. Your thoughts now after seeing that and, and after having seven days to think about it? <laughs> I agree with, <clears throat> with what he said. Uh, this 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 incident's probably been more scrutinized than anything else I've ever been involved in. Uh, I'm just you know glad to be here at California, ready to move on. Um, you know, I mean, like he said in the interview, you know, I mean, it was, uh, you know, it, it was it was one of those things. I mean, obviously they they, they touched on the fact that he had, he had a bad day, and I think he was frustrated and um, you know and, and aggressive. And I think we were all driving aggressive. I mean, I was driving aggressive. I was, I mean, I blocked him. You know, I took full responsibility for that. I mean, that's part of super speedway racing. You're supposed to block. And and and, and as far as I think anybody on that racetrack at that point in time. We had our crew chiefs in our ear saying, okay, you got about 10 laps before the rain comes. You know, you've got 10 laps. This is a 10 lap race. And, um, you know, him and I were racing for the lucky dog. And when he came back on the racetrack, he hit us in the left rear. And, and you know, you know why? Or if he misjudged or, you know, I mean, he said it wasn't intentional. I mean, I, I, mean, I guess we can only take his word at that. But, um, you know, and, and, and he wrecked us and it caused a big wreck. And I was mad and he was mad. And, and uh, but, but he did call this week and he apologized. And I, I, I admire that. And I told him, I said, I appreciate it. But, um, you know, it's, it's tough. You know, I mean, it's, you know, we've all made mistakes. We've all been there, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's just part of racing. But. Well I'm just ready to move on and, and go race uh, this, this race this weekend. All right. Well, good luck today on the pole going to the back with an engine change. But the second pole here at California for Brian Vickers. 
Thanks very much, uh, Krista. And, you know, it's not, it's not Junior's fault that he's the most popular driver, okay? It's one of, but there is the perception out there that it, you can't criticize him or you can't, or it's against the rules. No, I, I, he's so honest. And, I mean, and so open. He didn't, did he read a press release? No, he, how not I like some other athlete. Like, no, yeah, he was he, very real, very natural. He's one, of, he's one of the fans. He's one of us. No, and, and the thing is right now, if you don't like well, the way he put it, you, you just don't understand what a real man is all about. Because I need, think he really manned up. Like like Darryl said, he did. He stepped up there, and he told you like it was. But is he wanting to ch- is he want to be more aggressive because he wants to win more? I mean, there, he can handle that. Yeah. I think uh, he likes that Aretha song, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. <laughs> okay. like, one thing real quickly. He did not know he was eligible for the lucky dog. He thought because he got penalized, oh, he had he to be in front of the front. field. Okay. Because they were hollering, rain, rain, rain. He needed to be in front of the field, he thought, okay. to get the lap back. But he was eligible for the lucky dog, and he didn't know Vickers was a lap down. So there was a lot of things he didn't know. Hey, thank you, Paul Harvey, for the rest of the story. You got <laughs> uh, That's what you get <laughs> when you right. sit down and get to get to hang out. By the way, uh, Junior did qualify 35th for today's race, but a transmission problem, so he's going to move just a little bit uh, further back. A quick check on our Fox uh, NASCAR News Watch and close call. Members of Michael Waltrip Racing had a little excitement on their way through the air to Fontana this week, and they had to make an emergency landing in Vegas due to an engine problem. Everybody's okay. If you have to stop somewhere, Vegas is the place. We'll be there next week for NASCAR and Fox. The Price is Right. The first 1,000 tickets for the Cobalt Tools 500 went on sale at Atlanta Motor Speedway. First, the 17 car for Matt Kenseth of the Daytona 500 win. They sold out in 15 minutes. Cool cameos. Two of NASCAR's marquee names were seen around Hollywood this week. Carl Edwards on late night TV and Jeff Burton popping up on General Hospital. Time now for Gas and Go, presented by Ask.com. And no one oh knows the contents of these questions. Oh I'm ready for them this they week. They have been sealed bring it on. in Matt Kenseth's toolbox. All right, here we go. We're on a clock. Number one, Daryl, <laughs> did NASCAR end the Daytona 500 too soon? Should they have waited? Or did they make the right call with Ooh, the rain well, last that I ain't week? I got that question. Listen, they don't make rules to suit you, Larry, Jeff, me, any of us, or Fox or anybody else. They make rules for everybody. And overall, that was the best decision for all the teams, everybody involved. They did a great thing. All right. Fair enough. Uh, Jeff, uh, what grade would you give Stuart Haas racing after the Daytona race? They suffered a few crashes. Remember, Stuart, I think, wound up eighth and actually led some laps in the Daytona 5. I'd have to give him right now a B plus, Chris. I mean, I really think that you know they had a really good, strong showing between Ryan Newman as well as Tony Stewart. I felt like, you know, that Ryan got caught up in some wrecks and issues that were none of his own making and they didn't have quite the results for him. But Tony was very strong and I think he had a car that hadn't got crashed. He could have won the Daytona 500. All right. Daryl Martin Truex Jr. had the pole, finished 11th. Do you see him making the chase? Well, he, uh, I'm short answer. No. <laughs> no. All right, thank you. That's what I like, honesty. That's where you get. That's why you go to ask.com. All right, uh, Jeff, will this be a race one on fuel mileage? We're talking about today, and if so, who does that help? Who should we watch? Mm, I'd be watching the Rouse Fenway cars. I think they've got the fuel mileage figured out. I think Jack's got all this stuff kind of figured out, and they'll be the ones that can probably pull it off. All right, let's move on here to Daryl Casey Kane, the only Richard Petty Motorsports driver outside the top ten. Is he still the star of that team? Well, I think he is. Uh, certainly, Almondinger moved in and kind of took right. a little thunder away from all those guys, but this is the guy right here. He's got the big bud sponsorship. He's a flagship driver of that team. Uh, yeah, he, he, he's got some good wins. He's got some wins in the, in the future here. All right, this is for you, Jeff. The Roush and Hendrick cars. Well, they're successful everywhere, but here, even more specific, how, how so? Why? I, I think they've got a great engine combination, and on top of that, when you see the power that you need to run off these big sweeping corners, I think that right there kind of comes into play so much, and then the handling. These guys have got great crew chiefs and know how to set the cars up. Good job there, Daryl. Uh, Elliot Sadler fought to keep his ride, leading the 500. Did he prove that he belongs in that car? I love what the uh, crew chief was telling him. Elliot was uh, complaining a little bit about, oh, bad luck, bad luck, I'm not going to win this race. He said, you just get it. We got you there, now you keep us there. That was a great move for Elliot Sadler. Get a top five finish, a little momentum. He needed it badly. All right, and here we go for both of you. Uh, who would you want to play you in a movie? This is Oscar Day, Oscar Night. Who would you want? Clint Eastwood. All right, how about you? Ah, uh, man, George Clooney. George, I got a better one. Uh, Will Ferrell for you, and for you, Larry the Cable Guy. Wouldn't that be a good one? Hey, I'm <laughs> oh, just kidding. All right, thanks for being a good sport. All right, so. <laughs> I'm just thinking about who could play him. Carrot, carrot top, maybe? No, I, uh, Adam Sandler, maybe. I don't know. Steve Carell, how I about think, that? I think Conan. Conan, hey, there you go. He's moving to 1130. If you have a question that you'd like Jeff or Daryl to answer on the show, email it to askdw at ask.com, and then the question will be selected. We'll ask it live. 
live next week when we're in Las Vegas. It could be about some of the drivers. It could be about uh, who wants to play you in a movie. We'll get your Oscar picks a little later. <laughs> your pick for today or a final thought of what to look for, Daryl? Again, I'll take Jeff Gordon. It's a 500-mile race, and uh, fuel mileage will be, a, will be an issue. I hope we don't have any tire problems. I don't think we will, and it should be exciting. I know we're getting ready to Las Vegas. You want to bet on that? Because I'm still going to stick with McMurray. That's a long shot. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to go back Two to, to the, the tires for a moment, Daryl. I, th- I guess every week they could come into play. But yeah. real quick, how in a race like this off of Daytona they would figure? Well, they, they, all three of the series, the trucks, the, the nationwide cars, and, and the cup cars today have all run on the same tire. But this car is harder on right side tires than the other two series is. So if there was a chance for a tire problem, it would be today. Yeah, because the cars really slide around here. You go off in the corner here carrying almost 200 miles an hour. Car gets in a four-wheel drive, slip, slide, you might say. All of a sudden, that can really work on either the right rear or the right front, depending on which way the car is, tight or loose. And a slight chance of rain. Guys might be chasing it, but it should miss this area of where we are in Southern California. We, we hope so. We thought so I'm last week. Hey, uh, have fun up in the <laughs> Don't worry, have, any <laughs> have fun up in the you, know, the. you got your T-shirt from last year. <laughs> I did, the, I got we'll it. be okay. And your umbrella. Have fun in the broadcast booth with Mike and Larry. You Always got great it. having Daryl down here at the Hollywood Hotel. Jeff Hammond and I will continue with the pre-race show. Get you ready as these guys get ready to go racing on Fox. And wherever you are, we're glad you're tuning in to NASCAR on Fox at the Auto Club 500 presented by Quaker State. We're getting ready to roll here around the two-mile track of 500 miles, the second race of 36 for the NASCAR season and the points race. A Hollywood opening is full of fun and fantasy, but NASCAR opening reflective and patriotic as always. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please rise and remove your hats as the Centurion Battalion Accession Task Force, California Army National Guard, presents our nation's colors. Now, will you please welcome Jeff Hamilton of Motor Racing Outreach as he delivers today's invocation. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, in these days filled with such uncertainty, we are grateful that you do not change that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we are grateful for hope and for grace. Help us to live then with an unshakable faith. We ask for your blessing on this event and on all involved, protected drivers and teams, as well as our troops around the world. For these things and for so much more, we are thankful. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing and welcome three-time Grammy Award nominee, Little Big Town, performing our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fire For the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still. Coming up, the crew chief's checklist. Will Kyle Busch complete the three-race sweep? It's never happened before. Some driver will write his own ending today. At 200 miles per hour, it's reality TV, live on Fox. 
NASCAR on Fox welcomes you back to the Auto Club 500. There's Jimmy Johnson from El Cajon near San Diego beginning his quest here or continuing for maybe a fourth straight NASCAR championship. And the red hot driver of the weekend, Kyle Busch, could make history winning the Truck Series nationwide. And this race, we'll be watching him closely today. Jeff Hammond, Chris Myers from the Hollywood Hotel watching the race with you as we get ready to start out here. What's your Verizon Championship racing checklist? Well, Chris, when you take a look at this particular racetrack, I think you've got to understand that it's such a wide racetrack that one of the things you have to do is you've got to search around and find the right groove that works for you. Whether it's down on the bottom or it's running around the top, it doesn't matter. This racetrack allows you to do that. The second thing is you've got to take care of this engine. 500 mile marathon, we've already kind of touched on it. It can be very hard on the, the valve train. You need to make sure that you don't miss any gears and kind of keep an eye on your gauges. Don't want to overheat the engine. Then last but not least, avoid pit road mistakes. We saw what happened to Dale Jr. last weekend. It took him totally out of the Daytona 500 because he was forced to try to drive over his head to get back on the lead lap, got himself in trouble. Here you cannot do the same thing. You've got to be smarter than beat yourself on pit road. A couple of headline stories we've talked about, but, but Kyle Busch with a chance at history. I mean, does a guy ever get too worn out from racing as he has through the course of the weekend, even though the adrenaline rush is here today? Yesterday, I think it's going to be a good test for that because of the fact we ran not only the, the, the truck race, earlier that day at 12 o'clock, we was followed up by the nationwide race. So we're going to find out whether or not this kind of wear and tear, not to mention all the practice sessions that went along with it for the Sprint Cup Series. I don't believe it's going to affect this young man, but what might affect this young man is Jimmy Johnson, Denny Hamlin, Jeff Gordon. They were all better than he was in both practices. So they may be the ones who keep him from making this happen. Yeah, the name you didn't mention, Matt Kenseth, who, of course, won last week, and he said he's ready to go. He said he's not tired. He's had an active week. What about, and Roush Fenway cars have run well on this track. They have run well, but I think the key for him right now is just get a solid finish and kind of keep building on the points. You know, Chris, I mean, I just think it's all about the numbers. you got to make them happen. Daytona's important, but it's all about the numbers. You always go through the garage. Uh, crew chief's talking about a numbers game already this early. Yeah, the numbers right now are kind of like what I said. Daytona number one, number five has to be the five races that keep you in the top 35 as far as being able to make all the races. After that, number 26, that's when the cutoff for the chase is. And the obviously number 10, once you get in the chase. But right now, number five is what's important. You know, West Coast racing, we talked about the number of drivers from California. By the way, the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club was actually formed here in Fontana in 1948. So a great style of uh, motorsports, uh, racing and fans that are here. And we talk about the number of drivers for this kind of a homecoming, Jeff Gordon, Jimmy John, and how about the style of driving from a region of the country or now because of tracks and everybody being based in North Carolina pretty much evens out? Yeah, I think it pretty much evens out, but I think people who come from California, I think that Jeff Gordon kind of set the trend. We found out that guys from California can drive, and it's not necessarily you know, determined by whether you're good on a video game or not. I believe he came <laughs> into the series and proved his worth, and we started looking at what they had to offer here. And you bring guys like Jimmy Johnson in. He came through the basically off-road series through Nationwide to get to where he is today. He's proven that boys from California can't get it done. And we're going to get the command here in just a moment. We talked about how some of the guys have run well this weekend here as uh, Jimmy Johnson, certainly one of those. Casey Kane, uh, Casey Mears, Jeff Burton, they've kind of had a, a slow week. Of cars aren't running, or at least it appears, not the way they would like heading into this race. No, they've got some work to do, but this is what it's all about. You can work on this race car, and maybe the track, and you're driving along, you may pick up something, be able to make it work. Now, one thing I was noticing right yeah. there on the 48 car. Chad Knauss was going over the pit road map, trying to make sure he understands, hey, here are the guys that are around you. This is what we need to think about doing. This is where you can kind of hustle in. This is where you got to be careful, not get caught speeding on pit road. There he is. I think all of this right here is so important. The last minute, they are really working on fine-tuning this game plan today to make it happen. He's got a fast race car, and they're not going to make any mistakes on pit road. Like a coach going over the game plan exactly. with his quarterback. And you, you would think, Jeff, they're, they're the longest tenured team. I mean, working mm -hmm. together in great success, but that attention to detail, they're not you, taking you anything take for it, granted. You got it. That's the main thing. You don't take anything for granted. Just because you're the defending champion does not mean automatically they're going to pull over for you or turn a blind's eye when you make a mistake on pit road. That man's doing a great job right now. All right. There is a doctor in the house. Is, uh, we had uh, trackside Hugh Lowry. He's not a real doctor. He plays one on TV. Race fans, it is time for the most famous words in motorsports. Please welcome back the star of the Fox television series House and the DreamWorks animated film Monsters vs. Aliens opening March 27th, your Grand Marshal Hugh Lowry. Gentlemen, start your engines.
monsters versus aliens. It sounds like me versus you. <laughs> sounds like us two in the Hollywood Hotel. We're going to enjoy the race. We hope uh, you stick around for the start of things. What a cast. Stewart, Jr., Jimmy, Carl, and a lot more on Fox. The Auto Club 500 presented by Quaker State as we come to you from the Auto Club Speedway east of Los Angeles in Fontana, California and getting ready to race the California Adventure to take us through it. Our guys who do all season long and they do a good job. Larry McReynolds, Daryl Waltrip, Mike Joy, yes. The Three Amigos. The Three Amigos right. are ready to go. I saw that movie. It had a happy <laughs> ending, but I, mean, I don't think it's uh, Hey, this is, Ish in it. <laughs> this is Ishtar down here, okay? <laughs> the speeds at this racetrack, Daryl, are very similar to Daytona, where we started the season, but the racetrack is very different. How does this track drive differently than Daytona? Well, at Daytona, you can enter the turns at 190 miles an hour, and, and it feels fairly comfortable because you've got 31 degrees of banking to catch you, something to lean on. Here, you're going a good 20 miles an hour faster into a relatively Fat, flat turn, 14 degrees. Car does not want to stick, does not want to turn. Takes a lot of willpower on the driver's part to wheel it through the turn. Car wants to go straight, you want to go left. There's a big battle going on inside that car every lap. Roush Fenway's had a lot of success here. Hendrick Motorsports, Kyle Busch has won everything so far this weekend. Who are we leaving out, Larry? You know, dark horse picks for the Oscar. How about a dark horse for today? Well, there's no question. The obvious choice is Jimmy Johnson, the 48 car. You know, they've dominated both the practice sessions. Yeah, it, it, you look at the Roush Fenway group. They got their two favorites, Matt Kenseth, then uh, Carl Edwards starting about mid-pack. But when I watched practice yesterday, Mike, I don't think some drivers that we've seen a lot of talk about is two of the Roush Fenway drivers starting near the front of the pack. I think we've got Greg Biffle up there and Jamie McMurray. They looked awfully good. But we always have comers and goers here at this 500 mile race because 500 miles versus qualifying is a lot different. A guy I'm going to be watching, he was fast on Friday in qualifying, had to change that engine. He'll be at the rear of the field. I think Brian Vickers in that 83 car, he's going to be a guy that's going to be going to the front. All right, let's have a look at the starting lineup for today's Auto Club 500. Joe Nemechek made the show, missed it in Daytona. He will start 43rd in his unsponsored Toyota. Michael Waltrip, starting at the rear, goes to the rear. Along with Jeff Burton, John Andretti, Jeremy Mayfield in the show two weeks in a row. David Stremme back there with Travis Quapel in row 19. Scott Riggs in the race again, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. qualified there 35th, goes to the back. Rookie Joey Logano and Daytona pole sitter Martin Truex. David Gilliland from Riverside, California, replacing Mike Wallace in the 71. Eric Almarola. Dave Blaney is back behind the wheel. And there's Casey Mears. Ryan Newman and Paul Menard in the 14th row. Sam Hornis Jr., Carl Edwards, first of the Roush Coteers in the lineup. Let's let this cycle through and uh, have Daryl get on the horn. Jamie Mack, it's a DW Fox Sports booth. You got a copy there, buddy? DW Lab clear. Jamie, good news, you're on the pole, buddy. What a surprise. Uh, what's the view like? Well, it's going to be uh, it's gonna be a good one. 83 just out of the way. Uh, Crown Royal Fort Fusion has been uh, big good since we unloaded. Donnie and Derek and all the guys on our team have given me uh, a really good car. So we'll uh, see what we get here at the beginning and, and hopefully be fine for the win at the end. Roger that, buddy. Uh, you had a great car last week at Daytona. Got into some trouble there in, in the big wreck. You got a car that good today? You know, our car is, is equal to Daytona for sure. We, uh, we're pretty good on new tires, and it seemed to, to stand underneath us pretty good. So hopefully uh, make the right adjustments and put ourselves in a position at the end to, you know, to be able to fight for the win today. Well, I don't have to tell you, it would be cool if you could win today. Good luck, buddy. Four, thanks, DW. Because McMurray started third with Vickers going to the rear, the inside lane moves up one. That will put him to the pole when we get the green. Make it a great race day with the perfect balance of flavor and refreshment with Budweiser, the great American lager. Let's get down to pit road for late breaking stories, beginning with the executive editor of Speedway Illustrated, Dick Bergman. Well, Jeff Gordon has not won a point paying Sprint Cup race in over a year, but a week and a half ago at Daytona, he won his qualifying race and he is ever so good here at the Auto Club Speedway. Led more laps than any other driver in this series here 
and he has won here three times. Fast in practice, he starts sixth. Things are looking good for Jeff Gordon. Let's go to Matt Yoakum. Dick Dale Earnhardt Jr. hopes that history doesn't repeat itself as Fontana, California has been a site of some of his biggest hits and hardest luck. In fact, the past two years in this event, he's finished 40th. Tony Uri Jr.'s cousin and crew chief told me it's been a work in progress all weekend trying to get the feel that Jr.'s looking for in that 88 car. He pulled a lot of the Hendrick knowledge. Feels like they've made some good decisions for today, but now throw in another variable the weather. It's overcast at about 15 degrees cooler than it was during final practice. Steve Burns. Well, Matt, Greg Biffle won this race in 2005. Before that race, I asked him about his car. He said it was ridiculously fast. I asked him just moments ago before he got in how this car was. Is it ridiculously fast? He said, no, this one's bad fast. Krista. Well, a lot has been made about Kyle Busch going for history, trying to win three in a weekend. You know, Kyle, along with the driver of the number five car, Mark Martin, have won three races, all different series at this track. The last time Mark Martin won in a cup car, it was 1998. And on an Academy Award weekend, he's kind of like Mickey Rourke, perhaps. Mickey Rourke coming back after 14 years. Mark Martin coming back out of retirement to try to win a championship. He's never won an Oscar. He's been nominated several times. Let's take a look at our FedEx understanding the race from a crew chief's perspective. The trends of the pattern of the last eight spring races here. On the average, seven cautions. The least we had was five in 2002. The most we've had was 12 last year fighting a wet racetrack. On the average, the first caution comes out about lap 16, but in 2001, we did go all the way to lap 60. The longest green flag run, 81 laps on the average. That's almost two full runs on a tank of Sunoco race fuel. And the last caution on the average comes out about lap 224, roughly 25 laps to go. That's good stuff, Larry. I like that. Well, let's see if it comes into play, DW. Check it out. And I liked your Dale Jr. interview. He was very forthcoming. And uh, I think this is probably the first week that he's ever been in a position of being under the microscope for something that happened on the racetrack that wasn't positive. And uh, I liked his explanation. I did, too. His father taught him well. He's an honest man. Five drivers will go to the rear. If you followed our practice coverage on speed, you heard Dale Jr. talking about a questionable transmission that popped out a gear on him not once but twice. They changed it. Three engine changes and Reed Sorensen crashed and went to a backup car. There you saw pit road speed 55 miles per hour and at the fuel window 40 to 44 laps. Jeff Gordon told us he uh, has done a, an episode of Sesame Street. Yeah. They have worms, <laughs> and he goes, wiggly, wiggly, wiggly. Let's yeah. go worm racing, boys. Yeah. Well, we're you not, know, we're not going. the invitation, but there's only one real yeah. thing. We're not going to do that today. Well, let's get to it then. <laughs> well, DW, we're on the West Coast. It's Oscar night. It's almost prime time on the East Coast. Let's get this West Coast party started. Reach up there and pull those belts tight one more time. sessions he wasted no time in gaining command of this race. Boy, Angie Harding, she is excited. <laughs> I know how she feels. Those cars going under you that first time by, it is exhilarating. But Mike, Jimmy Johnson in the 48 team, not a great speed weeks finish 31st, never led a lap. Now they have five bonus points for leading that lap. Look at them right here. Three wide. Everybody wants a piece of real estate and wants to move up early. Well, now is when your car is going to handle its very, very best. Got good tires. Track's got a lot of grip. Pass them while you can. But look at that right there. Three and four wide. There's only 14 degrees of banking. That's the great thing about this two-mile racetrack. And look at her. She's still pumped up. Yeah, and it's 75 feet wide, Larry. And they're going to want to move that wall out another 10 feet if they can. 
threatening skies. An L.A. haze held up by the mountains off to our north and a low ceiling, heavy clouds and a drop or two of sprinkles on the property. It's really uh, just right. <laughs> it's a perfect forecast. <laughs> I like it that way. Yeah, so much for sunny Southern California. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, this is great racing weather right here. Look at that. Four abreast, plenty of room. Oh, but the, the the coming to the coming together off the turns, that's where it gets tricky. Yeah, three and four wide will work in the corner. It's like running into a funnel on the exit of the corner. I'll tell you what, that 18 car, he is picking them up and laying them down. Started back in the 10th position. He's halfway to the front, already cracked the top five. Well, he's got a heck of advantage on these guys. He's already run like 400 miles. <laughs> Jimmy Johnson out to a one second lead on Jamie McMurray, Jeff Gordon, Kurt and Kyle Busch, and Greg Biffle. And by the way, this is the furthest behind he's been in two days. <laughs> <laughs> second place. Oh, brother, <laughs> where art thou? Move over. Uh, excuse me, fourth place. Kurt holding off Kyle Busch next week. NASCAR on Fox goes to their hometown, Las Vegas. I'd be pretty encouraged if I was a Roger Penske in the Penske group with the way Kyle or a Kurt's running right now. This may be as good a run as I've seen them have on a track this size in maybe a year, Larry. It's been a while. Well, and I think they struggled with this car we're racing full time. They struggled last year at the mile and a half, two mile racetracks. They knew caution. they needed to come out of the box and caution is on the speedway lap five. Robbie Gordon may have brushed the wall up between turns three and four. Not sure, but we are under caution at lap five. I'm pretty sure he brushed it. <laughs> I just don't know if it hurt anything or not because he was up there with it amongst it. And that erases Jimmy Johnson's one plus second lead. So only five laps complete. Will they pit? I'll let you know in a minute. The Auto Club 500 on Fox presented by Quaker State. Tough enough for race day. Tough enough for every day. Real durable oil. And sponsored by Subway. The big event is back. Any regular footlong for just $5. Subway. Eat fresh. By Sprint. Get NASCAR Sprint Cup Mobile only from Sprint, only on the Now Network. And by the all-new 09 F-150. It's not just a new truck, it's a new F-150. Caution is out for the first time today. Yep, Digger's been here. Uh, the caution was not for Robbie Gordon. He did not brush the wall. Uh, the caution was for sprinkles in turn number four. The treadless tires on these cars mean they don't race in the rain. But we're under the first caution, and Larry, half the field, 22 cars elected to make pit stops. And that doesn't surprise me. You know, we knew the guys at the front of the pack would not want to give up that track position. But if you're at the back of the pack, you really never pass up an opportunity to put Sunoco fuel in that car to keep that thing as full as you possibly can. In the perfect world for those 22 cars, they hope we run five or six laps that would put another additional five or six laps on the tires of like the 48 and the 26. They come to pit road under caution. You stay out then and you gain that position back. All right, we're going to add a lap of caution. Brian, Ryan Newman's car has lost its transponder. He's going to come to pit road. They'll put a new one on and he'll get his position back. Hey, who's your favorite driver? Oh, <laughs> Dale Jr. <laughs> I wonder where he got that haircut. <laughs> All right, Ryan Newman replaced the transponder, but he has another problem. Look at the driver's side of the car and look at the rear wing. The end plate was askew when he came to pit road, and when he re-entered the racetrack, it came off. And that end plate is part of the aerodynamic package that helps the rear downforce and the side force of that race car. And it's something that he will not be able to drive that car without. They will have to come to pit road and replace that end plate. Now, in the NASCAR rulebook, the end plate is a required element on both ends of that wing. They have a choice of two. Uh, one is straight ahead flat. The other has a curve in it for different choice of aerodynamic balance. But you cannot be on the racetrack without both end plates. I had a fan ask me about, how come you don't race in the rain? Other sports play in the rain. How come you guys can't do that? I said, let me tell you something. Take a football player. 
take the cleats off his shoes, just put him on a pair of slick shoes and wet the football field down and see where he goes. That's kind of what it would be like driving a race car in the rain. You would slide right through the end zone. Or just show them a replay of the first part of last year's race where all, we, we didn't have a wet racetrack. We just had some wet spots and we wrecked two or three race cars so they finally realized what was going on. Under caution for a rain sprinkle. How about a little Aflac trivia? Who was the first California native driver to win a race in what's now the Sprint Cup Series? It's a long time ago. It wasn't that long ago. I was a fan of his when it happened. I was a big fan. Angie Harmon, Jason Seahorn still on the flag stand. They're having a big time. I'll tell you what, uh, our flagman buddy is going <laughs> to, he's got, he's got him a new sidekick. It, it, it's so much fun being up there. It is incredible when those cars go under the flag stand, what it feels like. It's like a big old vacuum cleaner. We'll let you ponder our Aflac trivia question for a minute or two. We'll be right back. We're under caution. This is NASCAR on Fox. Twelve laps complete in the Auto Club 500 presented on Fox by Quicker State. Six laps under green and then caution for a sprinkle in turn four. They're doing a quick uh, track drying and we will get back to green flag racing. There is Ryan Newman and uh, a second repair to make sure that that new end plate is properly affixed and a little pop rivet in the wicker. And yeah, there's he'll go. normally three bolts that holds that on. Now, NASCAR supplies the wings for these cars. When you come to the racetrack, they put the wing on, but the team supply those end plates. I think we're going to have some uh, audio here from Brian Vickers. Let's listen to what he has to say, and then I think I can uh, follow up. This carburetor is horrible. I mean, horrible. It died like four times on me coming out of the box, and I couldn't get them. I couldn't get the RPM in the iron. Uh, I, I don't know what they have. We'll just deal with it today. Uh, but, uh, you know, we had a really good handle on this carburetor thing second half of last year, but we've started back to square one. So, Larry, what's one of the keys to winning this race? Fuel mileage. Exactly. What, what happens a lot of times, the team, the, the tuner on the engine, these carburetors have squirters in them that when you, they're accelerator pumps. And a lot of times I've had t uh, tuners to try to get better gas mileage actually unhook the rear one. There's one in the front two barrels. There's one in the rear two barrels. A lot of times they'll unhook those. It won't accelerate worth a flip out of the pits particularly. But wide open throttle and working the throttle through the turns, you burn less fuel. It's not a lot, but it's that little bit sometimes it takes to win a race. She is still having a blast up there. <laughs> But yeah, engine tuners know that coming here, that you've got to work on fuel mileage and the crew chief hammers. Toyota as a whole, they have not gotten the greatest fuel mileage, so I'm sure they keep pushing the envelope. The uh, ceiling rising, the rain has stopped. We're about ready to get back to racing, so let's deal with our Aflac trivia question, which of course has a little disclaimer and a qualifier. First California native to win a cup race. Aflac says, The great Dan Gurney, Motor Trend 500, January uh, 1963, Riverside, California. Now, uh, wait a minute, before we get to that, Dan Gurney was born on Long Island. He grew up the son of a metropolitan opera singer. He's a Long Island native, used to watch his hero Ted Tappet race at Islip and Freeport, but his racing career started in Southern California. So that's why Dan Gurney is the answer. Johnny Mance won the 1950 Southern 500 in a Plymouth of which this replica is at the Speedway. He lived in Southern California when he raced, but wasn't born there, born in Indiana. So he's not the correct answer. I'm sticking with Dan Gurney. That's my story. And well, he was my hero and still is. And I'm sticking to it. He ran, he ran the only time I can remember having a three letter, a three numbered uh, car in NASCAR. You got to have That's two right. digits. And he had 121 and he won five times in 121. The bottom line, don't ever argue with the duck. That's the answer the duck gave you. <laughs> The Auto Club 500 on Fox, presented by Quaker State, is sponsored by Budweiser. Reach for the perfect balance of flavor and refreshment. Budweiser, the great American lager. Jimmy Johnson has led every lap so far. 
here in the uh, Auto Club 500 as the jet dryers. You can still hear them in the background. They are just about done as we have a look at our Ford Drive One moment with we race, we race, you win. And it's Matt Kenseth who last week won the Daytona 500, scoring back-to-back -back wins here at Auto Club Speedway in Southern California. A twofer for Matt Kenseth, who has been one of the most successful drivers in the brief history of this speedway. Want to win a Ford Fusion? Log on to WeRaceUWin.com to see how. Now, Mike, you mentioned we had 22 cars that hit pit road. Of the cars that pitted, this car, Matt Kenseth, that Drew Blickensdorf for Led Crew, they won the battle of those 22 cars. They were the first car off of pit road. So we had 21 cars that stayed on the racetrack. And I'm going to tell you right now, if I'm in the middle of the back half of the field and they get one to go, I'm coming down pit road and I'm at least going to top up. Okay, if you're headed for the refrigerator, come back quick. We're going racing in one more lap. Yeah, you know, we always talk about how many laps we can run on fuel here. And as we mentioned at the top of the show, it's about 40 to 44 laps. When you're under caution, a good rule of thumb at this two-mile racetrack is two caution laps equal one green flag lap. So that has to be factored into the equation when you're figuring your fuel mileage. And as bad as I hate to mention this, is it, it, with rain in the area, it changes everything. It changes your strategy. Uh, you're not looking at a 200 uh, 250 lap race necessarily not right now anyway right our man digger he's hard at work even under caution he likes okay. the cars at this speed <laughs> racing history as I recall uh, has has been updated and corrected so uh, I'm not sticking to my answer anymore in Oakland California NASCAR ran a strictly stock race in October 1951 most of the drivers were from the West Coast that's now the Sprint Cup Series Marvin Burke of Pittsburgh California is the first native Californian to win in what's now the Sprint Cup Series I think when we have questions that get though go that far back we, we probably should refer to Dick Berger and let him make sure he gets us an answer. One lap to green. There's Dave Blaney on pit road. Blaney making his first start of the 2009 season for Prism Motorsports. As Daryl mentioned, these are cars that are coming back on the pit road like Joey Logano in the 20, like Dale Earnhardt Jr. They're coming back down to top off a of fuel here at lap 17. I'm surprised more guys didn't do that because uh, this gives you a few more. It gives you a few extra laps uh, if thing if thing goes back to green for a while. Over the guys that didn't pit. Joey Logano, one of the two drivers battling for Rookie of the Year, had a great run in the Nationwide Series race last night. Got a top five finish, and we were dig, talking dig, 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 dig. earlier in the day. I think that was great medicine for him after what he went through at Speed Weeks last week. And he's brushed the wall here in practice. As Daryl pointed out during our practice coverage on speed, these cars so much different to drive than those nationwide series. When you mat 850 horsepower, it's a lot different feel than when you mat 700 horsepower. And these things will take off on you in a hurry. A little bit of a sprinkle. We're going to add one more caution lap. Welcome back to Southern California. Oh, his driver's not in the lead. Nice crowd on hand. The pre-sale for this race uh, was quite light, but every time I walked past a ticket booth this morning, there was a line. There was a very good walk-up crowd for this race. And we look forward to a full house next week in Las Vegas. And right now, the jet dryers are back on the racetrack because a little persistent, maddeningly light sprinkle is falling so time for an AT&T race break Chris Myers thanks Mike with uh, Jeff Hammond here in the Hollywood Hotel it may, it's not we have to worry about last year they've corrected the problem with water seeping up so we've been told and this looks like I was watching you're the, the, you're the only weeper I know uh, here I, I, right I, I, and I'll weep if we get <laughs> but it looks like it's mostly north of us and it's right. going through even our official weather people in Southern California they all have those fun names you know like uh, chip hail and storm fields and everything like that. they said don't worry most of it because the red carpet you don't want to get wet or the asphalt that these cars are rolling on it's well, got to be frustrating though for the drivers it, after it, last week I think that's week. the biggest thing after last week you know we don't want to come here and find out that it's 
place right here is already being influenced by rain, but hopefully it'll get out of here. We can get into a rhythm. That's the main thing is get into a rhythm where these guys can go racing, work on their race cars, and figure a few things out. We've already heard from guys like Greg Biffle, uh, Chris, that, hey, I had a great car yesterday, but this ain't the same racetrack I had been running on yesterday. So I think the nationwide race has got to definitely influence what's, what the tendencies that a lot of these teams are going to have to go to as far as working on their cars. Uh, yeah, are there any advantages uh, for any particular drivers or crews as we get these caution laps where they could kind of work some things out or communicate or do some things that maybe they, they didn't have a chance to do before we thought we'd roll? Yeah, well, you, you do, but at the same time, it's so short into the run that you're not too sure, well, what do I need to do? You know, do I need to make a big change here right now or I need to kind of like be patient and see if the track comes back to me? I think early on we're already seeing that Kyle Busch finishing up that race like he did must have brought some information back over to Steve Addington, the crew chief, because that race car right now is looking very strong, but he's still got to catch Jimmy Johnson, who, to me, has got the car to beat, at least early on. Yeah, that's what Carl Edwards uh, told us in the pre-race show. He said, I'm, I may be a guy who was one here before, but Jimmy Johnson, the driver to beat. To vote for the AT&T Fastest Pit Crew of the Year Award from your AT&T phone, text the car number for the pit crew you think will be the fastest and the most valuable in each race. The fan vote for the first place gets the car and crew 10 points. When our Jeff Hammond makes his pick, that crew will receive five points. And if the pit crew wins the race, that's five bonus points. So your vote uh, counts as a, as a fan, as a viewer. Vote each week for who deserves the AT&T Fastest Pit Crew of the Year Awards. Let's Thanks, check Chris. back upstairs, Mike. 20 laps complete, one to go, and we will get the green flag to restart this race. Jimmy Johnson, Jamie McMurray, Jeff Gordon, and the Bush brothers. Have a look at 10th place. Northern California native A.J. Allmendinger, open wheeler for most of his career. Uh, swap teams in cart. Won a bunch of races, came here to NASCAR, and he doesn't have a full season deal, but he came out of the box firing on all cylinders at Daytona. Had a great qualifying effort here. He says he is loaded for bear. Now his name's in the rumor mill again because Tuesday in Charlotte, North Carolina, Peter Windsor, longtime commentator and race team executive, is going to announce a new Formula One team based in the United States. And there are rumors swirling about maybe Almondigger in that role, and he's not denying them. Yeah, I talked to Richard Petty last night, and Richard said, well, I really like this kid. I like his personality. He's got a lot of energy. He said he has energized this whole Petty Motorsports operation. Daryl, just as you've been talking about, uh, we had two or three cars even come back to pit road that time. Dale Earnhardt Jr., Michael Waltrip, Scott Speed, they continue to top those cars off with fuel. There you see Michael leaving pit road now. All 43 cars still on the lead lap. As we get set to restart, it'll be 22 laps complete. Tony Stewart. And the Old Spice number 14 running in eighth place, started seventh. Had a, a good finish to what was a very trying week in Daytona last week. Very, he's very relaxed and very happy. I like, uh, I like the, way he's, uh, the way he's going right now. Green flag. <laughs> Jimmy Johnson hauls him off to turn one. He got company this time, though. They're not going to let him get away so quickly. Probably a little bit cautious getting down into turn one. That's where the rain was. With Jamie McMurray, that 26 car, he wants to lead this race. I think Jimmy tiptoed through there. And, of course, what happened to Jeff Gordon is he ran up on the back of McMurray. And McMurray had to get out of the gas a little bit. And it really hurt uh, Jeff going down the back. And look at that yellow car coming into frame right there. The uh, leader of the where did he come from crowd, Kevin Harvick, in the 29 moving up from 13th starting spot to 10th. Here he is up against Juan Pablo Montoya. And right now in, this, in a race like this, this is when you have to really give and take. Guys are going to be slipping, sliding, and trying to pass you, and you got to be sure you don't cut them off or run into the back of them, spin them out. This is the time to give and take. It's early, long way to go. Third place, the Bush brothers fighting. Kyle got up to third in that green car. Kurt comes right back on the outside and retakes the spot in the blue deuce. When you run that high line like Kurt Busch and the two did, Jeff Gordon and the 24, you can just keep it wound up. It, it just it kind of binds the car up sometimes when you're on the bottom. It seems like it does it more in one and two than three and four where they're at right now. Yeah, as you go down into turn one, Larry, it's, it's, this front straightaway, is it's a big D shape. So you really arc it down in. You stay out late like Jimmy Johnson is, and you just float it right to the bottom. 
when you get to three and four, it's a much more abrupt entry. You got to turn it to the bottom or else let it go right out next to the wall and ride the rim around the top. Kyle Bush about lost a spot there to Greg Biffle, and it looks like Biffle is going to move up. Yep, fifth place. We talked about him at the top of the show. I just think he's quietly had a good race car all weekend long, didn't have a great Daytona, wants to rebound with getting back on track here. But, you know, he just called in before that uh, rain started and said his car was terrible. Wasn't the same car that he had yesterday. What's he say now, Burns? Well, Daryl, you're right. The car had gone from bad fast to just bad. He said it was plowing and loose. Crew chief Greg Irwin told him, wait for the tire pressures to build up, Greg. I mean, when you know you're going to get long green runs here, I know the fans may say, well, if, if they drive bad on low air pressure, why do you start them on low air pressure? Because you know over the course of a 40 to 44 lap run, which is a fuel run, that you're going to gain so much pressure with heat, you have to start the pressure down where you don't have so much air pressure. They're like balloons. Kurt Busch has driven around the outside of McMurray for second. That's Bush in the number two. McMurray now fighting with Jeff Gordon for third. And yes, folks, as you watch the cars go down the back straightaway, they are running a little skewed. Uh, that's just one of the things they've learned about making more downforce with this new car. Matt? A lot of conversation, Mike, back and forth between McMurray and his crew chief, Donnie Wingo. Jamie says the car just way too edgy earlier on. It's a handful. Don't like an edgy car. Juki, maybe, but edgy, no. <laughs> And, you know, this is the point where I think we have some comers and goers. This is where handling problems will start to show up. Yeah, we, we ran, you know, 12, 13 laps of caution, but we're 26 laps into this race now. Well, that's what I like about coming on pit road and, and popping up with one to go. You don't know how long this race is going to go. What if it goes green here for a while? Right. You've got 10, maybe a 10 lap advantage over people that stayed out. First 10 nose to tail, and there's Denny Hamlin in the 11 inside of Kevin Harvick as they fight for 10th place. And those cars right there going by that camera is why this place is full of people today. Yes. You don't feel that at home necessarily, but you sure feel it here. That 11 car, Denny Hamlin, that just goes by Kevin Harvick in the 29. Denny started back in the 17th position. He's now cracked the top 10. Look at this thing. Look at that. 205 miles an hour into the corner. I'm going to steal a John Force line. I think I saw Elvis at that speed. <laughs> <laughs> and if you notice the slowest off the throttle, 149 miles per hour in the middle of the corner. And that's what makes it. Jeff Hammond in the pre-race talked about engine durability. That's the reason that you're always on pins and needles about your engines. Now, Darrell, the, the idea has been advanced about why not restrictor plates for this racetrack, and I think you just saw one of the reasons why. Well, it, restrictor plate racing is for tracks where you could run a car wide open. You could not, I don't care how, how big a plate or how small a plate you put on the car, you just couldn't run around here wide open with no banking. Restrictor plate racing is momentum racing. you got to keep the car wound up, got to keep your foot in it. It would be like we saw at New Hampshire a few years ago. It would just destroy racing of any kind here if we put plates on these cars. No, not enough banking and no throttle response. That's bad racing. Twenty nine laps complete. All 43 cars on the lead lap. You know, our Daytona 500 winner, Matt Kenseth, in that 17 car, he was one of those 23 cars that made a pit stop. He started back in the 24th position. He has now made his way up to the 12th position and continuing to gain spots. There he is right there behind Kevin Harvick in the 29. He can really get that car down in the corner good, Daryl, and it seems to really go through the middle under acceleration. Well, the turns are so big and sweeping, and the track is so wide, you just let the car kind of float out of the corner. Get it in. Got no pressure here. Mat it, and then just let it run up the hill until it gets out to the bank, uh, out to the straightaway. You hear a Kenseth spotter uh, up on the roof, Mike Kalinoff who got himself a unique souvenir of their Daytona 500 win last week, a big permanent tattoo. He said it hurt like hell, but boy, it was it's fun to have it there. And all the other spotters are uh, are really jabbing him about it, saying we want to see it. Not going to happen. All those other spotters are just jealous, I think, right That's now. It. 
How about Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s day, Matt? Mike running back in the 34th position. Junior has pitted twice under caution lap 17 and 21 to top off. But Junior says the car, as far as forward bike goes on exit, worse than it was in final practice on Saturday. Expect a lot of changes when they make their next stop on pit road. Well, yeah, I think coming in and topping off was one of the things he's doing. But I also think he was working on that car. Saw him made some adjustments to it. That's another good thing about coming in right now. If the car's not right, maybe you can get it better before you get into one of these long greens. And the lack of forward bite just simply means when he puts the throttle down, the rear is wanting to get loose. It's just spinning the rear tires. He has to play with the throttle to get off the corner. So it's it's not a dental problem. No, it's not something that your dentist can fix. <laughs> Jimmy Johnson, the leader, Kurt Busch in second, just ran his fastest lap of the race so far. The Auto Club 500 presented by Quaker State is sponsored by Ask.com. Where do NASCAR fans get answers? Ask.com, the official search engine of NASCAR. By AT&T, your world delivered. And by State Farm, where great coverage meets great rates. 36 of 250 laps complete. 36 laps, 72 miles. Jimmy Johnson out in front of Kurt Busch now by two and a half seconds. Jeff Gordon four seconds back with close company from Greg Biffle, Jamie McMurray, Kyle Busch back to sixth. Denny Hamlin rounds out the top 10 right now. Of all the cars that pitted early, Matt Kenseth's made the most progress. He's up to 11. Yeah, and as we, sh we showed at the top of the show, the fuel window was about 40 to 44 laps. But when you look at those 17 caution laps, remember I talked about a two to one ratio. It should let these guys that did not pit be able to go to about lap 50. But now here's the guy on the move is Ryan Newman in his 39 car. Remember he had the problem under that first caution where he lost the end plate off the wing, was all the way at the back of the pack. He has now made his way back up to the 23rd spot, so he's cracked the top 25 now. Joe Nemechek on pit road with the hood up. It's the uh, first of the cars to have problems today. All other 42 starters on the racetrack, and it looks as if they're going to push Nemechek's unsponsored number 87 to the garage. Let's check with Dick Bergman. Well, last year, Kyle Busch and his team were an absolute house of fire for about three quarters of the year. But when it came time to running for the championship, they just didn't have it. Kyle said that they needed to get a little bit more progress, step up, try some new things. And that's exactly what they're doing today. They are already thinking about the race that's going to happen here around Labor Day because that one counts toward the championship. So they're trying some different things. Right now, that setup is causing the car to be a little bit tight in the center, a little bit loose off, and he needs more grip. So they've got their work cut out for him when they do pit here in Kyle Busch's area. You know, Larry, as I, uh, as I watched the 48 car, the only time this whole three days we've been here that he wasn't number one on the sheet or in a race was uh, that one moment during qualifying when he got beaten by... Uh, uh, the, eight, uh, the 83 car for the pole. And you heard his explanation for losing the pole to Vickers. They'd both gone to in and out Burger the night before, and Jimmy had a double-double, and Brian just had a single, and that must have been the difference. That must have been. Five 100. As we said, was it a cheeseburger without the cheese? I think it was. <laughs> Confusing. Now there is Brian Vickers, who qualified on the pole but had to go to the back of the field for what NASCAR technically terms an unapproved change or adjustment prior to the race. And he's worked his way up to 21st. And, and you can see him, you can run on the apron here. Uh, you can run down off of both corners and, and in, on the apron, you can get into turn three very, very well with the left sides down below the white line, which is totally different than last week. And I tell you, that car running with him, David streaming that 12 car, his first year driving for Penske Racing, he replaced Ryan Newman in his car. David started back in the 38th position, and he's been keeping stride with Brian. He's up to the 22nd spot. And the reason you run so close like that, you get a good draft here. I mean, that car behind there, the 12 car, is getting a nice pull off of Vickers. You see Vickers go way down below the white line in the middle of the turn. It's certainly legal, and there's a lot of grip down there sometime. Rookie Joey Logano running in 40th spot in the mission for today. Bring the car home in one piece. Finish the race because as caution is out, raindrops. Keep falling on my head. Didn't that song win the Academy Award? A long time ago. Yeah. 
It's not one we want to hear today. Not here. There's a look at the 18 year old rookie in uh, today's Home Depot rookie profile. Joey Logano has a chance to reflect on his first Daytona 500 and his first week as a full time NASCAR Sprint Cup Series driver. Your car is sitting there when setting up for uh, the Daytona 500. That's when it finally hit me uh, that that's you know the biggest race you know you're ever going to be in really in the. Uh, the, the first time that the being that was really cool with uh, even though it didn't go completely the way I wanted to uh, you know I felt like I learned a lot and uh, a lot of stuff I can go for the next time we get there I can uh, use a lot of that a lot of it's just me still trying to get used to the feel of these cars and you got to have them they drive so different than every other car ever, that I've ever driven and uh, I think that any other car there is so uh, it just takes time to get used to the feel for these things and uh, I'm sure eventually I'll get it Darrell, that's one thing you remarked on, how different these cars must be to drive than anything else he's ever been in. Well, even the guys that have been driving in the Cup Series their whole careers, they, they, a lot of them don't like this car. And uh, so the good news for him is this is the only car he's ever going to have to drive. So uh, some of the other guys had the old it's twisted time, sister that they got to drive. So at least what he doesn't know, he doesn't know. Well, I'd say Pit Road will be a busy place. Krista, they're coming your way. That's right, and if it's a twisted sister, well, David Reagan says we're not going to take it because David Reagan is right in the middle of the Roush cars, all Roush cars running in the top 13. Reagan said his car, it needs to turn better. It's a little tight in the center, four-wheel slide off. Steve? Krista Kirk Bush in the number two car says he's a little snug getting into turn three. You see him in the upper left. Let's go to Matt. Bad news for the competition. Leader Jimmy Johnson said his car needed to hook better in the center of the corner. Chassis adjustment already completed, Dick. Jeff Gordon in for his pit stop, and like just about everybody else on my end of pit road, the car is tight in the center, and they are a bit loose off, so they're trying to make adjustments with air pressure to fix that problem. Kirk Busch is going to win the race off pit road. You know why? Because he's running good. I tell you, the crew always, Larry, you know this, they always step up when you're running well. It, it definitely helps everything. That was a great pit stop by Pat Trison and that crew. You also saw David Reagan, the Jimmy Finningling crew, that six car, the UPS car, uh, having some good stops. Under caution for the second time today for a light sprinkle coming across the track. Time to have a look at today's State Farm Safety Report. We've all rode down the road and had a rock fly up off the ground and hit your windshield. Imagine this rock hitting your windshield at 190 miles an hour. Imagine this rock being a lug nut or a wheel weight or other types of debris bouncing off your windshield. Well, a glass windshield couldn't stand that. But the windshield in the stock car can. The reason for that is a quarter inch thick polycarbonate hard coated windshield. That's right. When anything hits it, it's almost bullet resistant. It bounces right off. Watch this. You can't do that with a regular windshield. With stock cars, it'll take a licking and you can keep right on going. Somebody get me Mr. October. You know, Reggie Jackson drives the pace car here today. Uh, he's got a big fleet of muscle cars that he has restored and collects. Why'd you bring Mr. October to the February race? To remind everybody that the next race here at Auto Club Speedway is no longer Labor Day weekend. It's in October, which makes it, as Dick Bergman was talking about, right in the middle of the chase. Yeah, and, and Reggie is a great car guy. You see him at Barry Jackson yep. and Beach Homes and a number of those car uh, auctions. Now, we just saw John Andretti in that 34 car. Now, John is leading this race right now because they elected to stay out to get those five bonus points. That's a car that right now is in the top 35, but they're working very hard to stay there because once we clear Bristol, the fifth race of the year, we will go to the current 2009 owner points. The first five races based on the 2008 owner points. Reed Sorensen comes off pit road after having to make a penalty stop. Could be it. That's a backup car. Could have maybe didn't get enough practice uh, in the car to know exactly. Tax Barry a little bit. May have had a tachometer problem. Reed was too fast entering the pits and too fast exiting the pits. You serve one penalty for that. That makes you think there might be something different reading in this tack and what is a is a backup car. This backup car has something different about. It. Look at Bobby Labonte as we give you our first Ask.com trivia question. Well. 
For what team did Mr. October hit the most home runs in his storied career? You can't answer it. You have to go I, to I, I, ask dot com. It's hard not to answer them, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, especially I mean, it's, when you know. It's, it's like when you know the answer, you just want to. Dan Gurney is not the answer to this question, <laughs> but you can go to ask.com and find out. And Reggie has a brand new website, reggiejackson.com. He told us about it in pre-race. He's just launched that in partnership with ask.com. Uh, the answer is 269 home runs okay. or one team. Now John Andretti and uh, Dave Blaney, they've now made pit stops as well as Elliott Sadler. So now Kurt Busch, the two car, he's leading this race. And I, I don't know about Hammond's swing. There's some work to do there. <laughs> Kurt Busch won here in 2004. Let's take a look at this one more time. Looks like he's chopping wood. Uh, that's not the first time I've seen him do that. He's Mr. Third week of February. Which not a whole lot happens. I per, I would uh, suggest he bun it myself. <laughs> David Reagan, one of the Roush Coteers for Roush Fenway Racing in the uh, UPS Ford Fusion. Just Currently fifth. Continue to say that I think this is our next first time winner on the NASCAR Sprint Cup Series. We're coming green this time. We will complete 46 laps. 92 of 500 miles. Pace car is in. And Kurt Busch from Las Vegas, Nevada, past series champion, will bring them down to the green flag. We're back under green. That was Matt Kenseth dipping low in the banking on his teammate David Reagan. And Larry miss, uh, mentioned David Reagan right there in the six car. I saw this statistic and I couldn't believe it. He completed more laps last year than anyone, which based on his previous year, you would have never thought that. And almost made the chase. And almost made the chase. For well, the lead, here comes Jimmy Johnson right back at Kurt Busch. And I tell you what, his teammate Jeff Gordon in that 24 car, he wants a little bit of this battle too. Well, they're going to be a dead heat. Let's see. Looks like Jimmy Johnson barely leads that lap. And I tell you, when these when these things are on fresh tires and this cool condition right now, those engines are seeing 9,500 RPM headed off in the corner and over 200 miles an hour. Fourth lead change among three different drivers. Johnson, who dominated both practice sessions, back in that has led every green flag lap so far. You know, Daryl talked about the draft working. Jeff Gordon in the 24, Greg Biffle in the 16. They love seeing those guys run side by side. It pulls them right up there to them. How about a little NASCAR on Fox? Crank it up for a Sunday afternoon serenade. Working on Kurt Busch for second place. And Greg Biffle moving in in the 16. Jeff Gordon told us Friday what a tough year last year was, going winless. He won a qualifying race at Daytona, but that's not a Sprint Cup point race. And he can't wait to get back to victory lane, and they have pulled out all the stops to get him there. Well, a four-time champion with 81 wins, and you go into a season, you don't win a race, you never could have imagined that such a thing would happen to you. So he's probably still trying to figure out what happened last year, but he knows how to fix it. Win one this year. 
But, you know, he also told us that, you know, he was kind of having some back aches. Of course, he went through the birth of his daughter, Ella. He also told us on Friday, you know what? He's gone through the growing pains of being a dad now. His back feels great that he's been looking so forward to this 2009 season. Wow, we just saw Sam Hornish out of shape. And here comes Brian Vickers, who won the pole for this race and continues to move through the field after starting out back. He's up to 14th place. I like that line he's running. That's a, that's a good line to run because nobody else is running it. Two years ago here, Vicker scored Toyota's first top 10 finish in the Sprint Cup Series. That was the first time a foreign nameplate finished in the top 15 in NASCAR's top series since 1962 when Robert Barrier drove a little MG sports car to 15th place finish in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. See, Carl's back here. This is Carl Edwards in the uh, Aflac car there. He's running in the 15th position, and uh, hello. Boy, that'll, that'll get your attention. Travis Quapel in the 28 car got sideways. Brian Vickers in the 83 car took full advantage of that, went by both of them. And you saw that right rear tire smoking. I mean, that's how much horsepower these engines have. They can smoke the tires at 180 miles an hour. Next Sunday, NASCAR on Fox, Sin City, Las Vegas for the Shelby 427. Oh, 27 more miles of racing. That brings back a lot of memories, the Shelby 427 and our friend Dan Gurney. You bet. Reagan looking back at teammate Jamie McMurray. Seventh and eighth right now ahead of Tony Stewart, the red car. Steve Burns. Well, Mike, Daytona 500 champ Matt Kenseth started 24th. He is up to fifth. Before the caution came out, he told Drew Blickensderber, he said, I'm loose in and I'm bouncy off. If you can fix the center of the corner, we'll fix that exit. So what they did to that 17 car, they made an air pressure adjustment and lowered the track bar. Well, Daryl, I think that's what you and Jeff always and myself talk about. Fix the first problem first. Let's fix the middle of the corner, and then we'll see what that does to the exit. We may calm the exit down if we make the center better. Yeah, an engineer taught me that a long time ago. Whatever the first word out of the driver's mouth is, if he says I'm loose and whatever, or if I'm put, you fix whatever he said. The, the part that's broken is what he says first. Fix that, it'll probably take care of the other problem. Jimmy Johnson, Matt, has led every green flag lap so far. And, Mike, a quick comment as Jimmy drove by last time. He said after their last adjustment with the chassis, it's just as tight as it was the first run, if not a little tighter. But he is yarded out to about a three-second lead over the blue deuce of Bush. In the last four races here, Jimmy Johnson, a third, a second, and two victories at his home racetrack. Get the checkered flag ready. I'm going to victory lane. You're watching NASCAR on Fox. Fifty nine laps, one hundred eighteen of five hundred miles complete here at Auto Club Speedway in Southern California. Here are the biggest movers from where we started today. And what's neat about that graphic, when you look at David Rudeman, Michael Walter, Brian Vickers, those are all cars that had to go to the rear of the field because of an engine change. In fact, Michael never even made a qualifying run. He had issues leaving pit road on Friday for qualifying. Those are all Toyotas. It was a common problem between those. They put a coating on the lifters, and the coating was coming off the lifters, getting on the camshaft, and just wearing the lobes off the camshaft. That's what's the problem. But David Rudeman, he's He's had a good race car all week. He's moved up to the 16th position in that double zero. Hey, you know, he ended the year strong. I mean, you think about Homestead. He sat on the pole at Homestead. Uh, David is a really good little race car driver. And his teammate back there, Marcus Ambrose, and of course, Michael's not too far behind. Michael's 22nd. Michael Walter, my brother. Uh, they all those cars are running pretty decent at this time. 
And you saw Matt Kenseth on the biggest movers list because he starts where he usually starts in the mid 20s and he usually finishes up front. Not so unusual. No surprise. More on Michael Waltrip's team. Matt Yoko. Mike, we talk a lot about second chances in life. Mickey Rourke at the Oscars possibly tonight to pick up a big prize. But Shannon Myers, a member of Michael Waltrip's team, he parlayed an impressive athletic career, not only in the NFL, playing for Tampa Bay, Oakland, and the New York Jets, but after his playing career ended, he found a second chance in NASCAR as a tire changer. He's parlayed that about a year ago. He got a chance of a lifetime to step back into the movies. A big part as an extra in the movie Leatherhead, starring George Clooney and Renee Zellweger. Chance of a lifetime, about 30 minutes it was shot from the MWR shop. And by the way, if you'd like to see more of his behind-the-scenes photos, just check out FoxSports.com for more. And he says he's hoping to continue his acting career. You know, but there is a lot of stories on pit road with these crew members. I mean, they're not just guys that just worked on cars growing up. I mean, there's so many neat stories down there. And, and Matt and Krista and Dick and Steve do a great job of sharing those stories with us. You just think about, you know, uh, Jeff Burton was in a soap opera and uh, Jeff Gordon went, went and did the Sesame Street and, and they do television shows and they're on Letterman. Why, why are these guys, they're so comfortable because they're so real. It's who they are. They're not fake. These guys are just regular guys like everybody in this grandstand. They just happen to be a good good race car drivers in that as well. Well, like the Dale Jr. interview you did where yeah, it just kind of opened his heart up to you and it's honest. Yeah. You, you can't fake that. These Ken Squire probably said it best. These are common men climbing into these cars and doing uncommon things. These are heroes you can believe in. Yep. And I believe that. Now here's Jeff Gordon in the 24 car still running in the third position and Daryl mentioned that he just starred in a in one of the shows of Sesame Street and he actually played a commentator <laughs> and they wanted him to kind of get the race started. But no, he did not do boogity boogity boogity. <laughs> but since it was with the worms, it was a wiggly 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 and he got a <laughs> kick out of doing that. I'll bet his daughter will get a bigger kick out of it. She's a huge Sesame Street fan. Elmo. Everything's Elmo. For Ella Sophia. Jeff Gordon, he's running that Brian wow. Vickers lane in that 24 all the way below the, the white line. And again, we stress at Daytona, that was out of bounds. It's only out of bounds at Daytona and Talladega. It's perfectly legal here. At those tracks, they now have a double yellow line, no passing. I bet uh, his spotter and Vickers spotter are standing side by side. <laughs> and, and he's telling Jeff, you know where Vickers is running and making pretty darn good time. But, you know, Daryl, you mentioned that, you know, we think of the spotters up there to, to give these guys clear and where wrecks are. That's another role that a spotter plays, especially at a racetrack this big, is to tell the driver where drivers that are running well, where they're running on the racetrack. There you see them right there above the main grandstand. Kurt, uh, Kyle Busch yesterday came down pit road. Uh, and, and asked his spotter. They were talking about would take four tires to what And he said he asked his spotter what he thought they should do. Mm. That's how much confidence he has in his spotter, not just telling him clear and low, but also strategy, because he can see the whole track. Jimmy Johnson with a two second lead on Kurt Busch and Jeff Gordon fighting for second. The Auto Club 500 on Fox, presented by Quaker State, is sponsored by FedEx Racing. We understand every day is race day. By the Home Depot, proud sponsor of Joey Logano and the number 20 team. And by Napa Auto Parts. Napa, get the good stuff. Scott Riggs has just gone to the garage, joining Dave Blaney and Joe Nemechek. There's your leader, Jimmy Johnson, and his lead is cut in half. New second place car, Jeff Gordon. Running down Jimmy Johnson. I'll show you the pass for second. Well, Jeff had been working this uh, real low line. You can see he's down on that apron. And again, it's just a great place to run. A lot of grip there. And he's able to get back in the gas and really carry a lot of momentum up off the corner. And this is right here is where Kurt Busch had to say, OK, OK, uncle, you can get in. But Jimmy Johnson's lap times have fallen off a half a second over the last five laps. Yeah, all of a sudden he started running really high on the racetrack as if that car has picked up a bad push. Well, this is by far the longest green flag run that we've had, and we're probably right now, we're about 12 to 14 laps away from a pit stop. But yeah, once Jeff Gordon in the 24 passed Kurt Busch in the two, he just drove away from him. 
Yeah, the report on Scott Riggs in that 36 car, they're going to try to fix that car and get back out as they had to make a pit stop back on lap 67 with no fuel pressure. He went back out and fuel was actually spilling in the car from somewhere under the hood. You know what that 48's done? I just figured it out. Saving fuel. Oh. He's trying to stretch his fuel. To, I think they must have some fuel strategy that they're trying to work. Tony because Stewart. He slowed to, way down. Stewart trying to break into the top five. Excuse me, Darrell. Yes, sir. check with Matt. Stewart also trying to score something he's never done here in Sprint Cup competition, and that's a victory at the Auto Club Speedway, Mike. He said the car, very good, likes the field, but it needs to be tighter. That's what they're going to look at the next time they hit pit road. But Stewart pretty pleased so far with how this old spice car is running in California. But I'm going to tell you what, if I was Darian Grubb right now, his crew chief, I would not be unhappy to hear that the car is a little on the loose side because I think this racetrack is only going to get tighter as the night moves in and the track cools down. It's those cars like Jimmy Johnson in the 48 that are too tight right now. That's where you're going to have to take a big swing at it, making adjustments. Go back deep in the top 20. 18th place is Brian Vickers, who qualified on pole, had to start in the back, as did Michael Waltrip and Dale Earnhardt Jr. right with them in 20th position. And they're about a half a lap behind leader Jimmy Johnson right now in that 48 car. We still have 38 cars on the lead lap. And once again, we're about 10 to 12 laps away from what would be green flag stops. Except for those guys. Did they, or did, don't they have a little advantage? No, that but because early? of the, the caution we had there That's on right. lap 42, everybody's pretty much even on fuel and tires. Dick Bergeron. Well, Larry was talking about pit stops coming up, and that's what Brian Vickers really doesn't want because that is where his carburetor problem we told you about earlier is worse. He's got the best pit stall, but when he tries to pick up the gas out of a pit stop, the car is bulky. This is a brand new design race car. Brian Vickers has taken from the back of the back to mid pack. A new design, a new generation, a lighter car with all new geometry, and so far it's working. Thanks, Dick. Jimmy Johnson has just put uh, rookie contender Joey Logano a lap down. So both rookies, Logano, Scott Speed, along with David Gilliland and Jeremy Mayfield. Those are the cars one lap off the pace. Well, Mike, as I watch that 24 car, Jeff Gordon, you know, we've talked about him so much. You talked about him going winless. He has not been to victory lane other than the Gatorade dual race at Daytona, but he's not been to victory lane since Lowe's Motor Speedway in October of 2007, a long time ago for this uh, three-time champion. Dick? Well, Jeff Gordon ordinarily doesn't like a loose race car, Mike. That's very well known, and that's exactly what he's got now. He has told the crew that it is loose enough when he picks up the throttle that he can't get the kind of bite he wants. He's not getting off the corner as well as he'd like. So there is still more speed in that 24. Darrell, he may be loose, but yeah. he may be leading here in a second. But he smacked the wall off of two there with that right rear, but I don't think it hurt anything. Whoa, Jeff, be careful, buddy. Five, three wide, two above you. Casey Mears in the middle. I think and he's going to, you're going to see some right rear damage on that car when we get a chance to look at it. Because he hit that wall pretty hard there. He off turn two over there with that back end. Third place changes hands. Greg Biffle in the 16. In the Ford moving in front of Kurt Busch. Here's a look at Gordon. Kissing the wall. He just got such a run off turn two and the car just is in that four wheel drift. That's where he's talking mark. about it being loose, though, Larry. It's kind of up off the corner, and that back end steps out a little bit, and it touched the wall. I don't think it hurt anything. Nope, he wants the lead. All the way, all four wheels below that white line on the apron. Let's see if he can win the drag race down this front straightaway going into turn one. His car has been getting into the corner really nice. And Jeff Gordon leads a lap. It's the first lap he has led today. I want you to look at that side by side. Remember, we've already seen over 200 miles per hour going off into turn one. Darrell, I don't see a whole lot of teammate cooperation here, do you? No, uh, uh, Jeff, Jeff will be the first to tell you. We re race each other just like we are not teammates. We don't expect each other to give, you, give us anything. That's how we race each other. Both cars prepared in the same shop, the 24 and the 48. At Hendrick Motorsports, while Mark Martin's number five and Dale Jr.'s 88 are prepared in 
a separate shop in the same complex there in Concord, North Carolina. Yeah, Mark Martin in that five car, we see him right there. He's really not moved back, but he's not moved ahead. He started back in the 18th position. Now he's getting a little pressure from David Rudiman in at double zero. This would be a battle for 13. You won't hear from Mark until late. All five of the Roush Fenway cars have made their way into the top 10. 83 laps complete. Jeff Gordon leads here in Southern California. David Stremme and Martin Truex have just made pit stops. Next week, Digger and all the rest of the NASCAR on Fox crew will head to Las Vegas. NASCAR on Fox at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time and then to the mile and a half at Atlanta Motor Speedway in Hampton, Georgia on Sunday, March 8th. Jeff Burton is in. Clint Boyer and Steve, here's Kurt Busch. Kurt Busch has gotten Mike is going to drop air pressure on both rear tires. They're also going to pull tape off the front. The engine's gotten a little bit hot on that two car of Kurt Busch. Casey Kane, Eric Almarola coming in, and Sam Hornish on this lap as we move into a round of green flag pit stops. Ryan Newman is in. A rather lengthy stop on the two, but I think he's all right. It must be that tape they were getting off. Elliot Sadler on pit road, and here comes Jimmy Johnson. They should be all four tire stops. Jimmy Johnson's coming your way, Matt. And Jimmy's biggest complaint, Larry Mack, was the car was just too tight, especially it slides to a stop, especially on entry into three. Chassis adjustment, expecting to see how much brake they're using as the brake dust came off those wheels. As Mike Lingerfeld goes ahead and hits the lugs on that left front, Jimmy said it was also tight at both ends, but following his teammate Jeff Gordon, it helped him figure out what he might need to do later in turns three and four. The 29 of Harvick is in. His car is extremely tight as well. Dale Jr. is in. Tony Stewart's been in and out. So is Jamie McMurray. Dick. And Jeff Gordon is on his way in as well. The car has been loose, particularly coming off the corners, but they're going to leave it exactly the way it is. Just fire four tires at it, put fuel in it. They're not going to change the chassis at all. He's got a fast car. Krista. David Reagan says his car is a little too free on entry, tight off. David Reagan taking four tires on this stop. Kyle Busch is in, Denny Hamlin, Montoya, Matt Kenseth, Brian Vickers. A lot of takers on pit road. Greg Biffle picked up the lead for a lap, and here comes Biffle into the pits. Dick. Well, Kyle Busch is into the pits, and there is steam coming out of the right side of his car. He has not been happy with the performance of this car at all. Steve. Dick Greg Biffle says, I've gotten loose when I get on the gas at both ends of this racetrack. Tighten me up. So they're going to make one round in the left rear for the 16, Dick. Carl Edwards will be next to pit. They made a lot of changes to this car this morning. They didn't like the way it behaved in practice. They didn't know what they were going to have, but Carl has been very happy with the behavior of the car on the radio. It'll be four tires and fuel, as has been the case with everybody. Carl momentarily stalled the engine, wrench in the back to adjust the chassis as well. A nice pit stop underway. Nice and clean. Edwards is gone. Waltrip, Almondinger, Logano, and Speed among those on pit road as we cycle through green flag pit stops at lap 87. Yeah, you give up so much on old tires versus new tires. Once one or two cars started hitting pit road, you couldn't afford to stay out there because it's about two seconds that you'll gain with new tires. I think it'll be interesting to see how this 48 car reacts to the adjustments and the tires. Looked like he had it timed just right to me, Mike. He had a car that was given up right at the end of the run, right when you were was time to pit, which had to be a good that's a good way to have your car set up. And the battle is rejoined. Kurt Busch on the outside. Jimmy Johnson, native of El Cajon, California, made a trip back to his old stop ends this week. He has a car dealership with Rick Hendrick, Hendrick in Kearney Mesa, suburb of San Diego, and uh, visited the old neighborhood and got to see some folks. Another thing we know about that 24 car there that's in the middle of your screen, he likes to be out front. Uh, there's probably not another driver out there, another car out there that wants clean air all the time. It's not an environmental thing. No, it didn't. It's all that downforce on the front of the car. 
Jeff Gordon has gone back to the lead, coming up on 90 laps complete. I like the way this one's looking. More NASCAR on Fox coming up. The Auto Club 500 on Fox, presented by Quaker State, is sponsored by Verizon Wireless. Get the inside track from Penske Racing and race analysis from our drivers, plus highlights and high-speed action, all on VCast from Verizon Wireless, America's largest, most reliable wireless network. Jeff Gordon has a two-second lead on his Hendrick Motorsports teammate, Jimmy Johnson, Greg Biffle, about four tenths of a second back. Let's have a look at our Quaker State race summary at 93 laps, 186 miles. Jeff Gordon has led for 14 of those laps. Jimmy Johnson led most all the green flag laps of the first 80 or so. Two caution flags for a total of 20 laps for sprinkles. And most importantly, I think during that round of green flag pit stops, Two of the Roush Fenway cars, Greg Biffle and Carl Edwards, each stayed out to lead a lap, pick up five bonus points during the uh, pit stop exchange. And we're riding here with Carl Edwards in the 99 car, won nine races back in 2008 last year, started in the 19th position. He has moved his way up to the ninth spot. And I, I said I talked to Carl this morning and Carl was not excited about his car for today. He said it's just not we can't get it comfortable. And he said hopefully we've made some good changes and we can work on it during the race. I think he has improved it some Larry since the race started up in the top 10. A car here that's not comfortable is is very difficult to drive because you, you enter these turns at such a high speed. And if that thing is not acting right, getting into the corner, it, it messes up the whole corner. What about the driver load here, Daryl? At Daytona, with the steep banking, you're pushed down into the seat going into the banking. This track is relatively flat. How does it feel different? Other, other than the fact that it's 500 miles, you're going to be out here three and a half, maybe four hours. It, it, it mentally is not near as tough as Daytona. It's not near as physical as Daytona. And you've gotten enough straightaway down the back that you can sit up in the seat and relax for a few seconds. So I never found this to be a very demanding racetrack, physically or mentally. Uh, most of the time you just work on the car, trying to make the car better. New second place car, Greg Biffle. Yeah, that, that 48 car has gone off big time. And I think watching that long green run while ago, one of the better cars on the long run toward the end of that before pit stops was Greg Biffle in that 16 car. Now, Jimmy Johnson is running the same lap times he was when he was leading, 41 80s and 90s. But Biffle, that team has made their car better. He's running down in the 41 50s. But I'm not so sure the 48 car may not be worse. This racetrack is getting faster. It's gaining grip. It's cooling down. That's the reason we see a lot of these guys picking up the pace. The reason I know the 48 car is not right or not like he would like it, he's moving all over the place. Look, he's on the bottom now. He was up high earlier. He wanted to know where Jeff was running. He's getting down on the apron trying to make the car work. They got problems with this car. Not, uh, not problems they can't fix, but right at this moment, I don't think the car is right. Another of the Roush Fenway Fords, Matt Kenseth, the Daytona 500 winner, coming up against Kurt Busch for fourth place. You just got to know that at the end of the day, as everybody likes to say, that 17 car will be a player. No question. Well, and we talked about it earlier. You know, we've had 17 races here. And of those 17 races, 13 of them has been run by either Hendrick Motorsports or Roush Fenway Racing. When I look at our top 10 right uh, now. Here, the set of tires for whatever reason, Drew. Matt Kenseth talking to Drew Blickensdurfer, but of our top 10 cars, eight of them are Hendrick or Roush Fenway. Tony Stewart, the old Spikes car, 13 seconds back in sixth. From the top five on back, there is a big gap, an 11 second gap. Back to Stewart, Kyle Busch, Jamie McMurray. Here is Kyle. Yesterday, he won two of NASCAR's big three touring series, the Camping World Truck Series and the Nationwide Series. I don't see how he could come out here tonight and drive as hard as he did in those two races yesterday and have any gas left. Uh, he, he drove hard yesterday, won both those races. 
I'm real sure that he might not just be pacing himself a little bit physically. Well, Darrell, you pointed it out. Of the 250 laps raced here yesterday, he led 238. And honestly, those 12 laps that he did not lead was through cautions and cycle of green flag pit stops and things of that nature. Jamie Mack started on pole after Brian Vickers went to the rear due to the engine change. And here comes Carl Edwards in ninth place to McMurray's eighth. So four of the five Roush cars in the top ten right now. Krista? I want to update you on what's going on with the CarQuest Kellogg's car driven by Mark Martin. At the start of that run, Mark Martin said his car was a little loose, but not really a big deal. Well, it became a very big deal. When he came in on that stop on 80, lap 86, he said his car was extremely loose. They went several rounds of track bar for an adjustment. He said it felt like the right rear tire gave up early in the run, but just two laps ago, Mark Martin came on and said it's still loose, but a lot better. And, and Larry, I know you said that you think the track will tighten up and a loose this track doesn't do that this track actually loosens up when the sun goes down I don't know if it's the humidity I don't know if what it is but this track the cars get looser and you know it's interesting you mentioned that that was actually the nature of this car last year at it, it even racetracks where the track would get tighter it's like for whatever reason the aerodynamic package on this car we're racing now just tended to get looser yeah, I think a lot of the crew chiefs would anticipate, yeah, it's going to tighten up, so being free is going to be good. It just hadn't worked out that way. You know, Mike, our green flag stops, they came somewhere between lap 84 and 87. We seem to be on that green flag look right now. The next stop should come about lap 126. If you go back to one of our bullet points on our FedEx understanding the race, the average longest green flag run in this spring race here at Auto Club Speedway is roughly around 81 laps. So that's going to take us right there to that point, which will be right at the halfway point of this race. There's the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> Was he got a condo down there? They're all down there. I don't there. know. Jeff Gordon at 103 laps is the leader in the Auto Club 500. The Auto Club 500 on Fox is presented by Quaker State. Tough enough for race day, tough enough for every day. Real durable oil. I believe this is only the second cup race we've had in a long time here in California with a green flag run of more than 60 laps. We'll double we'll double check that. Yeah, this thing in the middle of the race, it'll generally go pretty long. Jeff Gordon, your leader. Greg Biffle, 2.3 seconds back. Jimmy Johnson, four seconds off the lead. Matt Kenseth, fourth. Kurt Busch in fifth. Even as, as durable and as dependable as these engines and, and cars are, you still have to pace yourself a little bit from the in the middle part of the race so that you've got some car left at the end of the day. Now earlier we had a couple of drivers talking Daryl about carburetor trouble. Yeah well th there's a lot of things a tuner does to get better gas mileage and particularly on a super speedway like this and I think if we go down to the cutaway car down to Jeff Hammond. Jeff you got a carburetor down there you can show the people what we're talking about. Uh, yes I do Daryl I got a couple of them here. Now you were mentioning a minute ago you were talking about the boosters and the squirters and some of the things that guys can do. First off here is a booster. This is what kind of pulls fuel down inside the carburetor itself. Let me show you on this beautiful Roush Yates engine we have here exactly what a booster does do. You come out of where the fuel is kept from the, through the, uh, the jets. It flows up through here and is pulled down into the carburetor. Now, guys can change that booster, make it a little bit more lean. They can also change the squirter, which when you're pumping the throttle makes a difference. Now, Darrell, you talked about the rear uh, pump, you can loosen that up a little bit. Again, it won't pump as much fuel, but what happens is when you get to low speed and you're working a throttle right in here, a lot of times when you throw it wide open, it stumbles. It doesn't get enough fuel and air mixture to do it justice. Until you get it wide open and it's really pulling a lot of air and fuel down through this carburetor, all of a sudden the driver complains about it stumbling, not running clean. This is some of the things that the engine guy has done to try to get the fuel mileage, but at the same time, a lot of drivers don't like it. You know, the most amazing thing about that whole piece, you ask Hammond, did he have a carburetor? 
Hey, hey, how many carburetors? It's like asking the preacher, does he have a Bible? Yeah, how many carburetors did he have anyway? He's but got notice, all kinds of carburetors. They're all cut in pieces. None of them work. But it, it was, a, he exactly, you know, he was showing the folks uh, that's a racing carburetor. Right. If you raise the hood on your car today, you probably wouldn't see a carburetor quite like that. Not and since that's about the other, 1992. Yeah, that's the other fascinating thing about these engines in these cars. They are push rod engines. They run on, they're naturally aspirated on a carburetor like you saw. They turn 9,500 RPM, and they live forever. Hanging there, but I know they're killing you down there, but nobody coming out back. Steve. Mike, that 16 team led by Greg Irwin doing a great job getting that car for Greg Bimple better and better. Just a second ago, Greg said, you give me just a little bit more grip off the corners, and you'll fix me right up. Uh, David Reagan may need a little fix up. Let's have a look at the number six. He's running that high line. Whoa, that's and the just car a just got loose. A little wee bit too high. Yep. He almost got up there where there's just no grip whatsoever. I think he picked up a lot of debris. Even at, the, at that high, you got to get into a lot of sand and dirt and debris on your tires, and the car won't cut. What are they saying, Krista? Really not much at all, Mike. Yep, he got up into the wall. They asked, how does the car look? Spotter Toby Weldon said the car looks okay. David Reagan really running right now about where he customarily runs here at California in four starts, ranges from 12th to 16th. So this is customary, but he knows he has a really good car. But again, they told him it looks okay. Yeah, he had made his way up into the top 10 not that long ago. Now he's fallen back to 14th. But, you know, back to uh, something that Daryl was talking about, about, uh, uh, you know, an eight-cylinder engine with a four-barrel naturally aspirated carburetor. I get questioned all the time by fans with today's passenger cars mainly being fuel injection. Why do we not go to fuel injection with these Sprint Cup Series cars? NASCAR, as we have pointed out time and time again, they work so hard to keep the cost of this sport contained to the owners in this sport. And if they went away from that carburetor to fuel injection, that would cost the owners so much money to develop that that it would just drive the cost way up. And there's another good reason. You can measure every part on a carburetor. You cannot measure as easily the computer that controls fuel injection and NASCAR does not want computers on board these race cars. But I know this is the car tomorrow and eventually we're going to be working on the engine in tomorrow because technology tells us we need to move to another era, to another level. So you mean Hammond's carburetors are going to be outdated? That's when we got problems. Jeff Gordon is your leader. We're closing in on halfway. The Auto Club 500 on Fox, presented by Quaker State, is sponsored by Viagra. By KFC, now get 10 great KFC tastes, starting at 99 cents on the new KFC value menu. By Toyota, moving forward. And by Sprint, get NASCAR Sprint Cup Mobile, only from Sprint, only on the NOW Network. Jeff Gordon, your leader, by three quarters of a second over Greg Biffle. We are seven laps from halfway, and we have 21 of the 43 starters still on the lead lap. Battle for seventh place right here, Kyle Busch and Carl Edwards. Well, of the two vehicles he raced yesterday, the nationwide car and the truck, I never saw him out of shape at any point in time. I never saw two better handling vehicles. Well, I've seen him out of shape in this race just a few laps ago. Yeah, today, watch this. Uh, just kissed it coming off turn two. The wall actually wedged right there, and he could just slide her right in there. Hey, you know, Mike, you mentioned we're about six laps from halfway. We have basically, as we're getting close to some green flag stops, David Streamy in the 12 car. But we have 41 of the 43 cars still on the racetrack. Scott Riggs is back out there nine laps down. Now, in the last round of green flag pit stops, David Stremme was the first car to pit, and he is yet again as this battle for seventh rages on. Yeah, the Dodgers are another one of the makes that when you look back at last year and the year before, they, they tend to get on the low side of fuel mileage a lot like the Toyotas. It looks like the Chevrolets and the Fords get the best mileage. Now, these two guys, Carl and, the, and the Kyle here, at the end of last night's race, uh, Carl was leading the race, and Kyle put a little shove on him to take the lead away right at the end of the race. So, uh, but obviously no harm, no foul, because they're, they're racing each other very nicely and politely here.
I don't know, Daryl. I don't see a whole lot of give and take here. Do you? Uh, well, it could be, a, <laughs> could be a, just a little rivalry there. You know, Carl may be just trying to. What did what did what did Kyle tell the little Wallace at Richmond? When you mess with the bull, you get the horns. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I would, uh, I would remember that. I think. Martin Truex, one lap down, makes his pit stop. As we begin our second consecutive round of, of green flag stops. Carl Edwards going to win the battle this Clear. time in that 99 car. That will put him into the seventh position. Elliot Sadler's in. I think we'll be, tires here, guys. we'll be seeing about all the leaders within the next three to five laps on pit road for four tires and a full tank of Sunoco race fuel. Hey, Jeff Gordon is really looks steady out front here. He's run some real consistent lap times and uh, that car has been really good on this run. Yeah, probably the only car I see right now that's keeping tempo with him would probably be Matt Kenseth in that 17 car who's sitting back there in third spot about three and a half seconds back. There's Matt Jimmy Johnson trying to run him down. I think whatever changes they made to the 48. They will undo the next time in because uh -oh. I think they hurt that car a little bit. Matt Kenseth, a couple of laps away from his stop, Steve. And Mike, he just had an uh, interesting description of his car. He said that in the center, it's a little bit spongy. That's the only issue he's talking about right now, right in the center. I'll take spongy over free any day. Probably not as near as severe. No. And the stopwatch kind of backs it up. I kind of like spongy. I'm not sure what spongy means, though, unless he's just looking for more grip, which I don't think you ever find all the grip you're looking I, for. I think what he's saying is it's not down in the racetrack as much as I'd like for it to be. Jeff Burton is in, Sam Hornish, and here is Kurt Busch in front of Steve. Mike, they basically want to undo the changes they made on the last stop. They're going to drop the track bar two rounds, of course, four tires. Kurt Busch, he had dropped to the eighth position after running in the top five. The two Hendrick cars, Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Johnson, have led all but five laps today. Any surprise to that? No. Not really. They looked that good in practice. They looked that good in qualifying. Those cars have been on it the whole weekend. Michael Waltrip getting serviced and Clint Boyer is in in front of Krista. That's right. Clint Boyer has been fighting tight in center. Loose off right now. He says killing the center still loose off really loose off for Clint Boyer. Reed Sorensen and Eric Almirola making pit stops. And here comes Kevin Harvick and Casey Kane onto pit road. There's Sorensen. Matt. Harvick lived off an idea of maybe making a track bar adjustment. They're going to try to free this car up with an air pressure change this segment and see how big the change that does change the 29 car. Meanwhile, Chad Canals calling the 48 car into his box. Canals' car tight earlier. The last run, it was actually free, especially on entry to turn three. Chassis adjustment on both sides of the 48 car. Kyle Busch down pit road and Casey Mears locked the tires up coming in. Joey Logano's in as well as is Brian Vickers. Dick. Well, Kyle Busch's car is much better this round than it was in the last, so they are going to give him a little bit of service. Not major changes on that number 18 automobile as one of the cans of fuel winds up on the back deck. Matty. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is in, Dick. They're going to make a chassis adjustment for Jr. on both sides of the car. He said it rode great for a while, and then all of a sudden the right rear just came unhooked, Steve. Steve. Matt Kenseth on pit road. Now he said his car had gotten a little bit free at the end of the run. You just saw him clean the grill, the temperature, water temperature up to 235 degrees, four tires for Matt Kenseth. Jeff Gordon hits pit road. Yeah, I knew when Matt Kenseth hit pit road to Jeff Gordon in that 24, he would not be far behind. You see Greg Biffle in the 16 falling him down pit road. Steve. Mike listening to Greg Irwin bark the commands. They're going to go down on the track bar for Greg Biffle. Dick. 
Jeff Gordon came into this race needing only 75 laps to have 20,000 career laps led, and it looks like he could well do it. They do have a wrench in the back deck of the car for the first time today. The car loose on entry, tight in the middle, loose off. Gordon wanted that change. Krista with a five. It's going to be a track bar adjustment. That's because his car has improved this run, but it's still a bit loose. It actually would get tighter as the run went on. A track bar adjustment and tires and fuel for Mark Martin. Look like that 16 car, Greg Biffle, Greg Irwin led crew. They won the battle off pit road with that 24 car of Gordon. Brian Vickers in now. I said he was in earlier. Actually, it was not. It was his teammate Scott Speed. So Vickers makes his stop, and that should pretty well cycle us through green flag pit stops. Well, I like that. That's 16. Man, when he came out of the pits and he got up on the back straightaway, he left Jeff Gordon in the dust. Now, we've now been under green for 81 consecutive laps, going all the way back to lap 46 on that second restart. The new leader. Here's the Ford Fusion of Greg Biffle. We're just past halfway in the Auto Club 500. One hundred thirty two laps completed Auto Club Speedway in Southern California. Just past halfway. Greg Biffle is your leader over Jeff Gordon and he got the lead on a fast green flag stop from his crew. When your car's good, your crew's good. And I think they like what happened on pit road. That's right. There'll be no ten thousand dollar fine for this celebration. No sir. That's a great celebration. Time for another question from ask.com the official search engine of NASCAR. There was a book called stand on it written by a fictional driver named Stroker Ace. Bill Neely and Bob Autumn wrote the book and it was all the great stories of stock car racing that you couldn't tell because of who was involved. So you attributed them all to stroke a race this fictional driver Burt Reynolds and Hal Needham did the movie and the question is how many drivers in what was then the NASCAR Winston Cup Series had cameos in the movie for the answer go to ask.com and enter the ask.com NASCAR challenge for a chance to win daily prizes and a trip to Talladega ask.com official search engine of NASCAR. I, try, I tried to get Fred Torkel to sponsor my car, but the, he already had a deal. Yeah, Clyde Torkel's Chicken Pit. Clyde Torkel was, was the Fred sponsor of Fred's his brother, brother's car. Right. Tell you what, yep. we're looking at Jeff Gordon, that 24 car on the bottom of the racetrack running in second. Greg Biffle is really having to fight through lap cars. Now he got hemmed up behind Casey Kane in the nine, Sam Hornish Jr. in the 77, trying to stay on the lead lap. And that really pulled Jeff Gordon in that 24 up to his rear bumper. The guy that he's hoping to, that back there that also hopes they'll hold him up for a little while is Jimmy Johnson. He has lost touch with these two guys up front here. Ooh, Whoops. This is going to be close. Thread the needle. Y'all be careful now, you hear? Now, Michael Waltrip in the 55 car, he's trying to stay on the lead lap, but look at Gordon. He's going to go to the high side of Biffle, but he's going to get him behind Michael Biffle and keep the lead. Jeff needs to get back down on that apron. The best got his car working to perfection right now. I think that uh, he and Jeff Gordon are probably pretty equal to each other the way it's looking. Jeff Gordon closing in on Greg Biffle trying to take the lead. Let's let him crank it up for a while.
Jeff Gordon is there. Hounding Greg Biffle for the lead. He got right to Biffle's bumper and then Greg managed to scoot away just a little bit. I just believe right now, still with 112 laps to go on a long run, and a short run for that matter, that's the two best race cars right there. Biffle in the 16, Gordon in the 24. Yeah, one thing I've seen out of the 24 today, normally he's good on new tires and he kind of fades. Today, looks like he's got a car that's really good over the long run, which is going to pay off, looks like. Lapping past a Southern California native and off-road star Robbie Gordon. Who's been a fixture, a regular in this series. And Robbie Gordon, one of, if not the last, driver owners in the NASCAR Sprint Cup Series. Made the swap to Toyota right now. Robbie is two laps down back in the 34th position. We have 16 cars on the lead lap now with 111 to go. Now, Jeremy Mayfield and Joe Nemechek own their own race teams, but we'll see if they run the full schedule. Robbie has for the past few years. And there's some guys up here just in front of the leaders that, uh, man, they better get going. Dale Jr., one of them, he's running 15th right now, and uh, the leaders are coming. You know, Daryl, I know as we headed into this 2009 season, when, when people, the media was talking about championship contenders for 2009, the three obvious choices, Jimmy Johnson going for four in a row, Carl Edwards trying to win his first, and Kyle Busch. But I just believe that Greg Biffle in that 16 car, when you look at the, the, the strides they made last year, they won the first two races of the chase. He not only was my dark horse in this 500-mile race today, he could be the dark horse in this championship. Well, it sure looks that way. I, I thought that. Quite honestly, I thought they just got lucky uh, in the chase when they won that first couple of races. But this team under this man's leadership right here uh, has really turned a corner. They're a contender. There's no question. Greg Irwin. Caution is out and rain is falling in turn three. And that caution is great news for Montoya, Rudiman, Earnhardt, and Stremme, who will stay on the lead lap. And it looks like Michael Walter. We just got to be careful every time we kind of tighten it up, it takes the speed out, but a little bit less than that would have been good. Dale Jr. And it looks like Michael Walter will be the recipient of the free pass as the first car one lap down. Chad Knaus not looking too happy about this rain. He looks well. He looks concerned. I think he's worried about his race car. What am I going to do to it? Because it's definitely gotten off from what it was early in the race. Yeah, they've been so good all weekend long. They started to race so strong, but it's like as this race got to go and they, they just lost the handle on it. Now we ran 95 consecutive green flag laps five times out of the 17 prior races here. We've had green flag uh, runs of 100 laps or more. What's the concern down there in that 48 pit, Matt? Mike DW hit it perfectly. The concern for Canals, he was seeing the trend. They were about a half second slower than the leader. Trying to get a, a long description from Jimmy about the car. He asked Jimmy, are you running the bottom early on new tires? And Jimmy said the car is just so tight, he can't run the bottom like he wants to. It's also a little free on exit. So they're looking at what game plan they're going to make on their next changes. Jimmy said the car felt much better this run, but Chad said, yeah, but we're not as fast. We're actually going the wrong way. We're getting slower. And that's that's a concern because those other two guys, Biffle and, uh, and, and Gordon, have gotten faster and they've gotten slower. And that's the problem. Pit road will be open. Now this is a light rain. It is not expected to be an extended rain. It's a very different situation than we had last Sunday in Daytona Beach. We are past halfway, but nobody right now is thinking that this light sprinkle is going to end this race. So likely there'll be takers on pit road. But if I'm David Rudeman, Dale Earnhardt Jr., David Stremme, last call on the lead lap, why not stay out there and ride it out and right. just just see? There's always that chance. Steve. Mike Greg Biffle saying his 16 car is real good down in turns run, uh, turns one and two, but he over rotates a little bit down in turns three and four, and he's fighting tight at the bottom of the racetrack. He gets a clean windshield and they make an air pressure adjustment, Matt. The center of your screen, the 48 Jimmy Johnson, a tear off Ron Malik, the car chief, and also a chassis adjustment, both wedge and track bar for Johnson, Dick. 
And Jeff Gordon is in for four tires. They are indeed predicting that the rain is going to stop. We're going to get this whole race in. Gordon likes the behavior of the car, so no major adjustments to it. Just the four tires. He said, wow, the big race off pit road. Matt Kenseth appears to win that one. Which is not unusual either when he hits pit road. And look at there, three positions gained. That makes me nervous. Why? Because what did he do last week? He got out front and it rained hard. <laughs> don't, rain. don't, don't go there. Darryl. Okay, okay, okay. That was last week. <laughs> a light rain falling. Pit stops have been made. We'll recap in a moment. The Auto Club 500 on Fox, presented by Quaker State, is sponsored by Amp Energy. Amp up. Welcome you back live, NASCAR and Fox, in time for an AT&T race break. Some uh, rain, light rain falling here. Juan Pablo Montoya had stayed out for a lap, but pitted, so Matt Kenseth would grab his first lead of the day, coming off the rain-shortened Daytona 500 win. Just a, a quick recap here as we had some caution laps because of rain. Jimmy Johnson here battling Kurt Busch. Jimmy Johnson leading most of the way early. Jeff Gordon keep an eye here as he scrapes the wall, but undeterred battles his own teammate. Jimmy Johnson for the lead. Johnson has led 74 laps. Jeff Gordon 49 laps. Those are your lap leaders so far. But Greg Biffle taking the lead off pit road. His pit crew helping out. So we may not have Hugh Jackman here, but we do have a Jackman celebrating. As a Greg Biffle and Matt Kenseth running 1-2, Jeff Gordon third as we stand at the moment. Our third caution, we just had our longest stretch, 96 laps of green flag racing in between the yellow. I just want to tell you one thing, that I taught Rodney Fetters everything he knows. He was a jackman right there doing the... You, <laughs> you know, were once a jackman. Yes, I was right there. But we, what we're seeing right now, I think, really, is a classic battle of trying to chase the racetrack. Early on, it was the 48 car. He clearly had the fastest race car there. Jeff Gordon's car kind of started coming in. He kept driving. Remember I talked about looking for a group? at the very beginning of our pre-race show. That's what he's been doing. He's been hunting around. He finally found out you can run on the apron here at this racetrack. He took the lead, and right now, I think he's po poised to really get after that 16 car because he knows we're getting, close, we're getting closer to the end. Yeah, we may be racing the rain as there's your Daytona 500 winner, Matt Kenseth. Yeah, when you look at that front right there, that's a, a windshield tear right, tear off right there that's gotten around the, one of the struts in the front nose. I don't know, it was a baggie from the freeway. I, <laughs> I thought it was Norm Benning. It was a net Benning going to an Oscar party, I think. All right, what about the adjustments? Uh, Carl Edwards, uh, they had to make adjustments. Greg Biffle, too, and Steve Burns has done a nice job tracking the adjustments that Biffle has made all day. Oh, yeah, because he, he talked about how bad fast his car was from yesterday's practice, and all of a sudden they dropped the green flag at the beginning of the race, and all he yeah, it was a bad race car, but they didn't give up, and that's the main thing. You've got to keep working on your adjustments, and hopefully your driver, again, he'll keep working on his line until he finds a place where his car is comfortable, and that's part of it when you come to California. You have to be working on where you're going to make your car work at. Right, How we, are you going to get it turned? And we've seen those, those long green runs here. Now, what about racing the rain that we saw? It shouldn't be heavy, but it's something that the drivers, the crew chiefs are thinking about. I think from here on out, you know, you've got to be cautious to the fact that it could come back, and it could end the race. So, when when I say cautious about it, you've got to get up on that steering wheel. I mean, clouds look like they're lifting behind us. It looks like it's going to clear out. I believe we're going to complete the race. But for these guys, I think you've got to run like the, like the next lap may be the last. Seven leaders and 11 different lead changes from your AT&T phone. Text the car number for the pit crew you think will be the fastest and most valuable in the race today at 2258. The AT&T fastest pit crew of the year award delivered by AT&T, the nation's fastest 3G network. We're live in Fontana, California, about 60 miles east of the Oscars. And the Daytona 500 winner, Matt Kenseth, is currently your leader here. And we'll continue in a moment. Vegas, it's showtime, baby. In Las Vegas, when you're hot, you're hot. Yeah, he's having really bad luck. Sin City became Spin City. He just having fun. He's the guy to put your money on. Here they come, and here they go. Want to make a little wager? Speaking of gambling, let's crank it up. Viva Las Vegas, boys, go racing! The Shelby 427 next week. This is the Auto Club 500, presented on Fox by Quaker State. 148 laps in, 101 laps to go this time by. Here's your Quaker State race summary. Matt Kenseth has picked up the lead on that pit stop. He's one of seven. Make that now eight different leaders. 12 lead changes and 18 cars will take the restart green flag on the lead lap. 
This is our third caution flag, and they have all been for rain showers today. You know, next week we go to Vegas. Now, for me, and, and Stevie's going to go with me, my wife, it's the most it's the most weekend I think we have. You get to go to all those beautiful hotel shows. I mean, the shows are incredible. Uh, the Beatles show love we're going to, and then we're going to go see the Jersey Boys. And those are just neat, neat shows and fun to go to. And what are just, you going to do? Just the facility. Linda's coming out there. We're going to hang out for a few days and going to take in a few shows. Uh, go down to Michael Gaughan, Brendan Gaughan's place, yeah. South Point. But just the, the racetrack, what they've done with that place, Daryl, with the, with the neon garage where the fans can almost get above the garages. And when they put the progressive banking at that racetrack a couple, three years ago, great racing there that we've had the last few years. Going to have another lap or so of caution before we go back to we go back to green. We're going to get one to go next time by, we're told. How about a little more from uh, Daryl's sit down yesterday with Dale Earnhardt Jr. as Jr. talks about uh, his position as far and away the sport's most popular driver. Most of the guys that have known me since I was a kid and know who I am respect me. The guys that don't know me that have come into the sport in the last couple of years uh, that are a lot younger than me probably don't. They don't understand what the popularity is all about because the, the popularity and the results don't match up. So, you know, that's just the way it is. I could have, the thing about that interview and he and him, I could have sat there all afternoon with him because you ask him a question and he speaks from his heart he tells you what he thinks. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. And, and he just, he, he is a great guy to talk to. That, that if you don't, if, if you want to know something, just ask him. He'll tell you. May not be what you want to hear, but it'll right. be what he feels. Well, it's like Mark Twain said, if you always tell the truth, you never have to remember anything. <laughs> That's right. We're getting ready to go back to green. Matt Kenseth, the Daytona 500 winner, is the race leader. His Roush Fenway Ford teammate, Greg Biffle, running in second place, the number 16. Jeff Gordon for Rick Hendrick in third. Kurt Busch for Roger Penske, the man whose company built this racetrack, in fourth. And Hendrick Motorsports' Jimmy Johnson in fifth. Next in sixth, the number 18, Kyle Busch, who already has two big wins this weekend, and then last year's winner of this race, the 99 Carl Edwards. This is the first restart that we will have where we've got all those lap down cars on the inside. Remember, the first two restarts, it was single file, so this is where it's going to get a little bit interesting. Cars trying to get back on the lead lap or be the first car one lap down. Yeah, this is this is not like the start of the race where everybody's uh, being real cautious. This is like the start of the last 10 laps, and you're trying to get a lap back. And the first of those lap down cars past winner here Casey Kane the number nine green flag but you know what I love about a 500 mile race whoa whoa how about that they just took it right to the bottom and look at Jeff look at the run Jeff Gordon in that 24 car got through the middle of one and two he pulls to the high side of Biffle he's looking for that second spot but it's like Greg Biffle said, dead gummit, you beat me off pit road, I'm going to beat you back on the racetrack about Kenseth in the 17. But this is like a reload. I mean, everybody got to work on their cars, and now their cars are better. And, uh, man, we're going to see some, some guys that uh, we haven't talked about all day, like Matt Kenseth leading the race. Steve. Mike, just before the pit stop, Matt Kenseth said to his crew, I can't hustle it like I was in the center. I was really making hay. So they made a track bar adjustment and an air pressure adjustment after the pit stop when he took the lead. He said, I'm just out cruising around being spoiled by my pit crew as usual. <laughs> They're on these restarts. Everybody's got new tires. Everybody's back up on the wheel. Everybody's Superman. That's right. And you got to, this is when you got to capitalize on those four new tires and trying to get by people that maybe you'll have to race later in the day. I would also just say that don't look now, but I think whatever they did to the 48 car, they've undone. And he's looking pretty racy again, too. And would that come as a big surprise? Not at all. 500-mile races are like plays, though. You have the opening act. Then you got the middle in there where you kind of establish a story. And then you have the end of the race or the end of the show where you find out who the superstars are going to be. Uh-huh. Dick Bergman. 
Well, last fall, the 48 car absolutely dominated here. Won the pole, won the race, led all but 22 laps in that event with a setup that was a little bit different. And Jeff Gordon had the option of using that setup, but chose not to because he had no opportunity to test it. So you might have thought, given Jimmy Johnson's success and what happened to Gordon, he finished 15th and led just two, he would have tried that setup this time around. He did not. Johnson's setup, Gordon's setup, two very different setups for the racetrack this afternoon. Right now, it looks as if what Gordon's got is the better of the two. Well, don't, I'm gonna tell you what, don't look Dick. now, Dick. <laughs> because right now, Jeff Gordon has a rear view mirror full of his teammate, Jimmy Johnson, at that 48. Now he's going to have to look out the left window probably to see him. Well, I just know that that last time in uh, that they did I'll something with a 48 car that I'll he just ride. did not I'll like. Ride. And I think they've undone it. And that now the car is back like it was beginning of the race. But he cannot complete the pass on Jeff Gordon. Not this time. And Biffle's right there. Race leader Matt Kenseth and Greg Biffle in the 16 just ran their personal best lap of this race. Well, they've got those fresh tires. This racetrack is really cooling down. Matt Kenseth out there. He's not having to fight any other traffic. There's no question this is where they're going to run their faster lap. And one of the things that this car has proven over and over again, the guy out front does what the 17 is doing. Drives off and leaves the other guys. Well, even in Southern California, clean air is good air. That's exactly right. This car loves it. Second place. Johnson wants it. And Gordon gives it up to his teammate. Well, Jimmy Johnson couldn't do it on the low side, so he moved to the high side and was able to complete the pass, but Gordon's fighting back now on the bottom. Well, the bottom's the shortest way, but the top's the fastest way. And Johnson prevails. Here's Matt. And Jimmy Johnson on the last stop said the car, the forward bite was so much better. It just wouldn't roll the center well. After some changes, now he's saying the car is just so free, can barely hold on to it. Free is fast. For a while. Uh, well, that's what uh, that's what uh, Chad was trying to tell him. We're going the wrong way. We tried to tighten it up and slowed it down. Exactly. And because they were too tight early, and it's only going to get tighter. Now I think they got it close to where they want it. But now look who has been leading all weekend in the truck race and the nationwide race and who presently is lurking in sixth place. That would be the younger of the Bush brothers, Kyle. I just think he's been pacing himself. I think you only got so much. I don't care how young you are. You only got so much gas in the tank. You better save a little of it. Well, he made history yesterday. You see it right there. Won two major touring series races on the same day. He's trying to become the first driver to win three touring series at one racetrack in one weekend. He's our leading Toyota top performer. Running at sixth, he started 10th. Denny Hamlin started 17th. He is in 11th and Rudeman 15th. You know, Darrell, we've only had three cautions, and they've all been for rain. And what's interesting, with that pit stop everybody made on lap 143, it's still a two-stop race. They cannot make it to the end on one stop. I just think it's fascinating how no matter who gets in front, Matt Kenseth at this time, uh, that he can just pull away from everybody else, although it looks like Jimmy Johnson has really got his car tuned up now, and he's coming. We've got action all over the racetrack with in-car camera shots. I just think this this, this car is so sensitive. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a really fickle race car. A minor little adjustment will take you right out of the game. But a minor adjustment will put you right back in the game, and that's hard. That's the hard thing about sitting on that pit box. One of those onboard views, the one in the upper left corner, was that six car right there going through the frame. David Reagan. Now he was a top ten car earlier, but he's now fallen off the lead lap. Krista. Yeah, Mike dropped back at first because he scraped the wall a little bit. Right now he's having to drop back because he's overheating. They think they have some paper on the grill, so he just needs to drop back and try to cool things off. David just came on the radio as I've been talking and said, yeah, Jimmy, she's starting to come back now. But they, they, he hurt that car a lot more than I think they realized when he slammed the wall going into turn three. That car took a lot of damage, has a lot of damage to it. But you know, all day long, Krista and the guys on pit road, they've been reporting with a lot of these cars flirting with overheating. 
This place is notorious, a lot like Michigan, about getting debris on that grill opening. And remember, these guys run a lot of tape on the front end anyhow for downforce and drag reduction. You don't have a big margin of an error if a hot dog wrapper or something gets on that grill opening. I think it's a year or so ago, what they call it, the hot dog wrapper 500. Because <laughs> every, everybody, was everybody had them on the grill. 17 cars are on the lead lap, and uh, in that last round of pit stops, Matt, it looks like they've improved Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s car. A wedge and air pressure adjustment, Mike, has seemed to really get the feel that Dale Earnhardt Jr. is looking for. He, though, like so many others, are saying the car now seems to be going more and more to the freeze side. Another concern, a lot of the spotters warning their drivers rain could be coming back in the area, so they are trying to get up on the wheel. But, Darrell, you mentioned it, that that seems to be the tendency of this car, maybe even this racetrack, to get a little bit looser as they go. Let's get amped up and go for a ride with Dale Jr. Let's see how he looks in there. He's got a pretty good uh, handful of wheel, so that means the car might be a little tight. Let's see how he looks going down into turn one here. Puts those hands over on the left side of the steering wheel, gives a nice hard tug on it. I think that car might be handling pretty well. Looks a little tight, but Jr. always cranks the wheel hard left like that. He likes to be able to crank on it. Relaxes. See how he gets his hands all nice and relaxed. Kind of takes a deep breath. Heads down the straightaway. Now he's coming up on the corner. Loads up on that left side. Got both hands pulling down on the wheel. Car actually looks like it's handling pretty good to me. He doesn't look that busy in there. No, he doesn't. However, his lap times are about half a second off of what leader Matt Kenseth is running. Yeah, if I was looking at that and I was critiquing it and saying, what do we need to do to the car? Looks like it's a little too tight. Got a lot of wheel in it. Matt Kenseth has company. Jimmy Johnson is coming for the lead. 87 laps to go in the Auto Club 500 presented by Quaker State. You're watching NASCAR on Fox. Club 500 on Fox, presented by Quaker State, is sponsored by UPS, official delivery company of NASCAR, and proud sponsors of David Reagan and the number six Ford Fusion. 336 of 500 miles complete, and reliability is beginning to fade on a couple of cars here. Sounds like it's shake, rattle, and blow right now, because uh, We've heard uh, several different cars starting to report down on the cylinder, 88 Dale Jr. being one of them. Well, that's not surprising. One of the first things Jeff Hammond said when we came on the air today with the pre-race show, this is a engine builder's nightmare. Because when you look at Dale Earnhardt Jr., yeah, he's run 169 laps in this race, but he ran 70 laps in practice. And we're also hearing at Jimmy Johnson, you can see him right here in the 48 car, that he's slowing down. Oh. And Krista, maybe an outbreak here. here. Mark Martin in the five. Caution is out. Raining again. And let's check with Krista. I mean, 300 cars with engine trouble at the same time. Well, Larry, Mike DW, Mark Martin came on the radio and said, we may be out west, but the engine is heading south. He thinks, said when pit road, but with the rain coming, they don't want, they want to stay out. Mark said, valve cover come off. Matt? The update on the 48 of Johnson, he said the car popped out of gear, put it back in the fourth gear. Dale Jr., they've told him to look at the different switches. He said he has done that. That's what they told him. The five of Martin has a similar problem. Now, Jimmy Johnson popping out of gear. That happened to Dale Earnhardt Jr. twice, uh, once in each of the practice sessions. Her Jr. just going by. You can tell he's definitely in trouble. Take your word for it, Dennis. Still. Yeah. So with two of the Hendrick cars for sure sounding like that they have engine issues, you know that Jeff Gordon, they're certainly going to be concerned in his camp, and, and not to mention Tony Stewart and Ryan Newman, because remember, they have Hendrick engines as well in that 14 and 39 car. Even though they're Chevrolet, Fords, Dodges, and, and Toyotas, there are a lot of common pieces, or at least common suppliers in all of these engines. And the camshaft makers, everybody might run a different design camshaft but it's built by the same company rock arms so on and so forth 
Was Matt Kenseth pushing the pace car? Oh, or was he getting the debris that might have been on his grill? Off and it's there? exactly you saw How it fly away that? because that changed the whole pressure on that front end. And uh, rain or not, here they come to pit road, Steve. Well, Larry Mack, that's exactly what he's trying to do. As Matt was talking about, <coughs> excuse me, his race car, he said, whoa, my water temperature is up to 270 degrees. Make sure you get that grill clean. Otherwise, he said his car is just a little bit tight, but he's very concerned about the temperature, Matt. Johnson's car much better as he slides to a stop. Slight track bar adjustment. Going to go up about a round and a half on this stop. Dick? And Jeff Gordon parks perfectly in his pit crew going to work a minor adjustment in the back of the car. They did contemplate staying out decided that the weather radar was inconclusive. So here they are. Wow. Beaten by the 17. Tell you what we call them the killer bees that pit crew for Matt Kenseth. They stayed exactly where they came in. You know who won that race off pit road. Tony Stewart Tony Stewart because he stayed out in that 14 did not car. pit. I don't think that's a bad move at all with uh, that many cars, fewer cars on the lead lap. Lots of different strategy. We'll explore them in a minute. The Auto Club 500 is presented by Quaker State, sponsored by AT&T, your world delivered by Vault. Drinks like a soda, kicks like an energy drink. Vault, get to it. By Aflac, ask about it at work. And by Lowe's, for all your home improvement needs, Lowe's, let's build something together. Fourth caution of the race here in Southern California, uncharacteristically, all four of them have been for light rain showers in different parts of the racetrack. Now, six drivers on the lead lap chose not to pit during this caution flag, led by Tony Stewart and Juan Pablo Montoya. Dale Earnhardt Jr. came in for a change of spark plug wires, went back on track, reported that did not help his ailing engine. Now, last year, in the two races at Auto Club Speedway, there were no engine failures in either race. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, we raced here on Monday last year. I think it was a pretty nice day. Uh, but this cool air, uh, the cool track temperature, cool air, the engines, they just make more power, which means that they have more of a chance of something going wrong with them. Now, Mike, one of the cars that stayed out, Mark Martin in this five car, uh, there's there's about 40 cars that want to get back to racing. There's a couple of cars that don't. One of them would be Tony Stewart, who's leading this thing. But Jeff Hammond, Mark Martin in the five car engine situation there. I think he's praying for rain, too. I'm pretty sure he is right now, Larry, because we talked about this in the pre-race. You know, you got to take care of these engines because it is a 500-mile marathon turning over 9,000 RPM. And a lot of times what gets you in trouble has to do with this valve train. This is the rocker arm. It moves the valve up and down. This is the spring that keeps the tension on that valve. And if you'll look here very closely, when this piston comes up, this is the intake valve. Look how close they get together. Now, Jimmy Johnson talked about his transmission you know, jumping out of gear. If he over revs the engine, all of a sudden that piston and valve, they come up and they touch one another. Well, I could easily warp this valve or break it off. And that might be what happens has happened to some of these cars late in the, in the day here. If they've had this kind of problem, this could be the culprit, these valve springs or this valve here itself touching the top of the piston. In any case, what this does mean for a lot of guys, if they've got this problem, they're not going to finish this race. And if they do, they definitely will not be a factor as far as finishing well. Well, when the Pushrod V8 debuted in 1949 at Oldsmobile and Cadillac, the service limit RPM was under 4,000. And now we're turning to more than twice as much, Jeff. A lot of things have been improved since then, obviously, to enable that. But it's still, it's the same basic engine architecture. Well, what happens is the head of that valve, if it touches a piston, it will tweak the valve. The, the piston will hit it and break it off. It'll knock a hole in the piston, and that's where the smoke comes from. Matt, what are they doing to Dale Jr.'s car? Mike, back in again. The last stop, they used a temperature gun trying to see which cylinder was cold. They couldn't figure it out because it was all the same temperature. This time in, they used a crayon like the tire specialist used to mark the tires because that way they could see which cylinder was melting the crayon and which cylinder they've lost, which didn't. Well, you can hear it's not running right. Uh, Jeff can explain. Well, what Matt's talking about, when you go, go over and raise the hood on the car, they take the heat gun, and what they're doing, they're putting it on these exhaust pipes. And if there's not any flu, uh, fuel getting in that cylinder to be ignited by the, the uh, spark plug, this 
exhaust tube will be cooler than the rest of them. So they know exactly which one they're looking at, whether it may be a problem with the plug wire or what may be going on. So that's what these teams are looking for is trying to identify which one of these cylinders is the culprit as far as the problem is concerned. That heat gun can tell you that by looking at the exhaust tube temperature. They're giving the field. Are they giving one to go? Yes, they are. Yes, and that's why Stewart, Montoya, and well, some of these other drivers have come to pit road because we're looking to go green next time. Yeah, on. but the one to go, but the caution lights are still on the pace car, so that uh, maybe that I can't see the flagman. It's Excuse me. It was two, was, I, I think it's two to go. It's yeah, two to go. It is because. Uh, but, but that's the, an indication of the teams that we are going back to green. So pit stops for those drivers who did not come in earlier. Dale Jr. is back in again. We're getting to re getting re ready to restart, so don't go away. Baseball and Billy Billy Good Dude, Jeff Hammond. And on April 11th, Fox Saturday Baseball returns to bring you another season of great moments from some of the game's biggest stars, as well as showdowns between the game's best teams. Fox Saturday Baseball Game of the Week, April 11th in high definition, only on Fox. I think that was an illegal bat, to tell you the truth. Green flag, and we restart with Matt Kenseth out front. Mark Martin and the rest of those lead lap cars made pit stops with one to go. So it's Kenseth, Jimmy Johnson, Jeff Gordon, Kurt and Kyle Busch, Greg Biffle, Denny Hamlin, Kevin Harvick. Now with that caution and all those pit stops, we are now into a one-stop race here with 73 laps to go. Three wide Kyle Bush. the Bush brothers. That 18 just keeps creeping toward the front, boys, all night long. Just methodically been working his way up there. Well, I'll tell you why, because that pit crew for the 18 car has done their homework. They did not start this race with a car they were happy with. The chassis wasn't performing as well as Kyle Busch had wanted. But on every pit stop, they have made minor adjustments, and they've crept up on it, crept up on it. And now they're real close for Kyle Busch. Well, his well they're getting ready to go three wide yeah. and get down the back. Fighting back on the high side, and the two car, and Greg Biffle, and the 16th following him. Mark Martin up in smoke. Got one more cup. And I think we knew that that was inevitably going to happen. Yeah. Now Clint Boyer, the 33, is a lap down as Martin coasts toward the garage. See Mark on the bottom down here. Number five. Oh, yeah. And there she goes. That valve that uh, Jeff was showing us, it quit going up and down. It just went down. Craig Biffle comes back into play in the 16. He wants to be the rock between two hard places. <laughs> Daryl Larry and I talked in pre-race, and, and I think Biffle, I think that's the car to beat here tonight. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, I don't know if you noticed or not, but the guy leading is the car to beat tonight. That's All the right. guy I think has got the ace up his sleeve. Because yeah, only in about three laps since that restart, Matt Kenseth has pulled out over, 30, 40, 80, over a second lead over Jimmy Johnson. In fact, Matt Kenseth just ran his fastest lap of the race at a 39.95 just a lap or two ago. And that is a lot faster, I mean, by about a half a second than what we've seen all night long. Here comes the Biff. Now, that was smart on the Kurtz part there. He didn't want to race Biffle into the corner. He knows he's faster. And he let him go. That was smart driving. Darrell, that 39.95, that'd have been a respectable qualifying lap. <laughs> it on did really would have. And he, you know, no matter what anyway, happens tonight. Away. Unless he gets to within two, I'm not gonna say nothing. If Matt Kenseth wins this race, hadn't anybody done that in quite some time? If Kyle Bush wins this race tonight, that's history. So we can make a lot of history tonight. But I tell you what, that 48 car, Jimmy Johnson, he wants to make sure that no history is made tonight with that 17 car, that 18 car, as he goes by his teammate, Jeff Gordon, in the 24. Well, there's no question the 48's back on their game now. They just got off a, uh, you know, and it goes that way, Larry. You start off, oh, I'm too tight. Well, you lose, oh, now I'm too loose. Kind of a couple of stops and you get it back right. Matt Kenseth has gone to victory lane in this race two of the last three years. 
Gordon to the bottom, looking for second place against his teammate, Johnson. And that's about where Jeff Gordon in that 24 car, he's been all race long, is right around the bottom. He got that good runoff turn two on his teammate, and he'll take the position away. I think there might have been a little give and take there as well because they know they still got a long way to go, 68 laps to go, plus one more pit stop at least. Seventeen cars on the lead lap. Let's go back to David Rudiman in 13th place. He's running about nine seconds behind the race leaders, and Krista is in David Rudiman's pit. And there is definitely a reason why, Mike, the Aaron's Dream Machine Toyota has been more of a nightmare for David Rudiman today. He lost his brakes. He first mentioned it back on lap 163 when they came in on 175. They checked all the wheel wells to make sure there were no leaks. They said everything looked dry. They checked the calipers. They thought maybe something with the master cylinder, but they went ahead and went out. He just came on one lap ago and said, I have no brakes again. You know, Darrell, we used to would come to a two-mile racetrack and never even think twice about the brakes, but I think just the speeds they're carrying here, the characteristics of this new car, they're using a lot of brake even at this two-mile track. When you see the teams pull the front tires off, the right front tire, and you see all that brake dust come out of the tire and the wheel, uh, that tells you they're using a ton of brake here. Now, 17 cars on the lead lap of the cars that stopped at the end of this caution period, Tony Stewart, who was then leading under caution, has fought his way back up to 10th. Tony's just had a kind of a mediocre car tonight. He's been hanging around the top 10 there most of the evening. Still a good run for he and uh, Darian Grubb. Montoya coming right with him, who stopped on the same lap as Stewart at the end of the last caution. And there's Jamie McMurray, and, and I think all of us agree that when the race started, we thought he would have one of the cars to beat tonight. And he's still, well, right now just barely out of the top 10. You know, the Childers cars, they're not having that great of a night, but one guy that is staying right in the top 10 is right there in front of these guys. We're riding with him here, the man that finished second in the Daytona 500, Kevin Harvick. Matt, he seems to be carrying the Richard Childers banner tonight. Larry, Larry Mack, he also told me that they felt like near the end of last year, they really hit on their intermediate track program. It showed at Homestead, even though it ended with fuel mileage, they were there all night to finish second. The last run, the car was loose. It made an air pressure change. Now he says, in driver terminology, it is stupid tight. I just can't believe how bad it is right now. It, just, it doesn't take much to jump the fence with an adjustment on these race cars. You can be loose, you can make a slight air pressure adjustment, and next thing you know, that the front end won't respond at all. Well, at the end of last year, in the chase particularly, I know Kevin Harvick, they didn't have the fastest car in those last 10 races, but they sure had a very consistent car in those last 10 races. And now we got a little battle here for third place. Here comes Biffle. Battling Jimmy Johnson for third. You know, we may not have another restart, but I, I just think if Biffle could get out of the gate on a restart as good as Matt Kins is getting out of the gate, he could get up there and I think he could run with his teammate possibly. I tell you, there's a little bit of a battle going on right here. I know we got to keep an eye up front, but Jamie McMurray and Tony Stewart, they are having a little bit of a disagreement about track space. This is coming down the front a lap or two ago. And here comes Tony, and they just about collide right here. And this battle, it, this continues on. This was a, a lap ago. They're having quite the disagreement about who needs to be ahead of who. And there's no sense in battling over space. There's plenty to go around here. <laughs> yeah, this is a, so. big, Buddy, keep that up. Keep wheeling it. a big wide We're race track. Right here. This is a I don't big think my brakes will make it, though. Oh, that's boy. Jamie. Oh, just be easy on them. I think that's Jamie McMurray. Yeah, it was. This is a big wide racetrack like its sister track, the two-mile Michigan International Speedway. There, you could run five wide here if that's what you felt like you needed to do. Matt? And the concern, though, for his crew chief, Donnie Wingo, is not about the battling on the racetrack with the 14 of Stewart. It's about comments from Jamie saying that he might have something amiss with the brakes. He says the pedal seems to be going closer and closer to the floor. He's losing the pedal on that 26.
You know, one thing to also point out about the brake situation here, I think we've well documented the speed you enter the corner. This racetrack, it has no more banking than the three-quarter mile track of Richmond, Virginia. Yeah, long sweeping corners, but you have to use brake with this race car getting down in the corner. See, that's another one of those engineering things, though. Uh, big brakes on a car on a speedway like this is unsprung weight. And these cars are already heavy on the right side anyway, so you probably come with a minimum amount of brake thinking you're not going to need it. And the minimum amount of cooling pumping air to it. Yeah, and not a lot of air either. Strong run for one, Pablo Montoya. He made that pit stop with Tony Stewart, and there's his target car, the number 42. Made, they, they made that. Great, dude. They switched makes in the off season at uh, what's now Earnhardt Ganassi Racing. And uh, Juan Pablo is ninth, and here are the Bush brothers yet again. This little uh, whoa, family squabble for fifth place. I think Kurt in the two car, he knows his brothers a little bit better than him right now, and there's no sense in pushing the envelope still with 60 laps to go. Say I'm over here. No, I'm not. Now I'm over here. No, here I am. I'm over here. <laughs> 60 laps to go. Daytona 500 winner Matt Kenseth leading Jeff Gordon by just that much. The Auto Club 500 is presented by Quaker State. Tough enough for race day, tough enough for every day. Real durable oil. And sponsored by Lipitor. By Sprint, get NASCAR Sprint Cup Mobile only from Sprint, only on the Now Network. And by State Farm, where great coverage meets great rates. 55 laps to go, and it's a three-car battle for the lead. Matt Kenseth. Got us a race, boys. Jeff Gordon and Greg Biffle. It's on. It is. And you know what? Jeff Gordon's trying really hard, Larry, because he knows he needs to get ahead of Matt Kenseth on the track because apparently that 17 beats the bunch is going to beat him out of the pits, and he wants to be ahead of him when the next pit stop comes. Here's what Jeff Gordon said just prior to the last restart. 17's in a different different league, but uh, you guys are doing great, and he's not beating us yet in uh, down pit road. Tonight we're gonna do what we're gonna do. We can beat him on the racetrack. We got car enough. You're doing a great job, Pick. Just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Still having a hell of a lot of fun out here. <laughs> right now he is beating this 17 car on the racetrack, and I'm telling you, we got a great crowd here, and they are all standing on their feet right now. You know something he told us the other day that I hadn't heard him say in a long time. I'm starting to work out a little bit, you know, and, and I tell you one of the things that really pays off working out is late in these long races. But Darrell, the 24 car didn't get off turn two that good the last time. Kenseth's going to take advantage, but Gordon's on the high side. He's keeping that 24 car wound up. He should win the battle back onto the front straightaway. Gordon led the last lap and Kenseth tucks in. I tell you, Jeff's car steps out a little bit off of two over there every now and then. It did that last time by. Uh, and we saw him hit the fence off of two over there. He's got to watch that high line coming out of there. Jimmy Johnson still fourth. Kyle Busch fifth. Kurt sixth. And we still have 17 cars on the lead lap with 53 laps to go and one more pit stop coming about 20 laps from now. Hello, Biff. Here comes the Biff now. He got a great run off of two. And the two Roush Fenway Fords switch positions, and Greg Biffle will see if he can take it to Jeff Gordon. Now, Biffle's car has been really good on the long run. That's one thing that I know for sure. Oh, my goodness. Look at that 48 car. Way out of shape. Holy cow. That's dirt track. He thinks he's at Eldora. Well, he knows he's running out of time, and those cars up there in front of him, they're getting smaller and smaller. He was a pretty good off-road racer, I think. Yes. Kyle Busch chasing Jimmy Johnson. They are three seconds behind the leaders. That little green car right there. He is trying to make history tonight. And he's getting closer and closer to doing it. You know, when I look at Jeff Gordon up there leading this race now with 52 laps to go, it, it kind of surprised me the more I thought about it, though, that he told us, you know what? I don't have fun driving a race car. Yeah. I have fun when it's competitive and I get to go to victory lane. 
Now, I don't reckon that makes him a whole lot different than any of the rest of Probably us. Probably not. <laughs> there Probably ain't no not. more fun than going in there and getting that champagne. He said it's over. a lot like work when you're not competitive or not winning races. Now, look at the 18. What did Kyle Busch say in pre-race? He says, we've got a top 10 car. But he didn't sound like a fellow who had the checkered flag in sight. Here he is racing, though, for fourth place. Uh, maybe having a better night than he first thought it would be. Well, he's he's going to run uh, 750, almost 800 miles here this weekend in two days. He got it. He got it. Yep. It's actually a thousand right, miles. Good work. Yeah. 50 right two, here. That's right. The two races yesterday. Well, if, you know, if you were 23 again, that wouldn't be such a tall order, would it? People say that to me all the time, and I can't remember. I, 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 that's still a lot of racing <laughs> in one weekend. You know, as we're getting down here and there. See just a few as we're getting down to about 12 to 15 laps before those pit stops. I know Jeff Gordon was talking about that the 17 car is in a league of its own on, on pit stops. But what I have witnessed tonight under those green flag stops, Jeff Gordon's probably doing as good a job of anybody getting on the pit road down to 55 miles per hour. Dale Jr. goes a lap down to his Hendrick teammate, Jeff Gordon. And, and watch those cars come off the corner. They are sliding those cars. They're in a four-wheel slide up off the corner most every lap. Jeff Gordon has won here three times. But in the last nine races at Auto Club Speedway, he has only three top tens. I believe Jeff Gordon's going to have a big year this year. I just think he's poised to really do it. Now, Matt Kenseth led a lot in this green flag run, but he has slipped to third, Steve. And Mike, Matt Kenseth just told Drew Blickensdurfer, I need grip. I'm too tight in three and four, and I can't hammer the gas like I was off of turn two. As young crew chief said, 10 four, buddy, we're going to fix you up on the stop. You know, Darrell, one reason that handling problems will start showing up as well, these guys are trying to run a lot faster lap times than they've run this entire race. That's right. Uh, I thought that Kenseth had the car that, like Jeff Gordon said, was in a league of his own, but I think he may have run the tires off of it. Brian Vickers has had a decent night. He was our pole sitter. Yikes. And uh, had to restart at the back due to an engine change. He got lapped once in his number 83, but got the free pass, got back on the lead lap. And Vickers right now is 13th. And I'm sure he's not looking forward to that one final pit stop. He's been complaining about the carburetor stumbling on pit road at low RPM, but everybody will have to make one more stop here shortly. Bobby Labonte in 24th. He is at one lap back. And the ask.com forward. And in about 15 laps, three pit stops. But what, what a clean race. I mean, with seven laps to go. We still have 38 cars still on the racetrack. We've had four cautions, but every one of those cautions has been for just a little light sprinkle of rain. And we really haven't seen a lot of changes. It's different people, same group of guys, just different ones take turns leading. From Ask.com, how many current NASCAR Sprint Cup drivers are from California? Get the answer now at Ask.com and enter the Ask.com NASCAR Challenge. Win daily prizes or a trip to Talladega. Ask.com, official search engine of NASCAR. If you watched our pre-race show, you'll know the answer to that. Or if you go to Ask.com. That too. When will the next pit stop come? Not too far from now. Kevin Harvick has been running at the finish of 81 consecutive NASCAR Sprint Cup races, the longest streak, and that streak is over. Hang on, folks. This is going to hurt. Keep it safe. Keep it safe. Had all the look that a right front Blue tire just went soft. Corner, Definitely a right front. Blew a right front. You feel so helpless. Thing just falls down and takes off straight to the wall, and there's nothing you can do. Harvick was running 12th. And this is the first caution of the night for an on track incident. It answers the question when will pit stops come? They'll come in about a lap or so. 
And while we were away, Dale Earnhardt Jr. took his car to the garage with engine trouble, unable to maintain NASCAR's minimum speed. Now, I know that didn't look like a big, oh, well, he didn't hit it that hard. Folks, just remember what we've said all night. Going 200 mile an hour going off in that corner. Pit Road is open. Steve. <laughs> Well, Mike, for the Roush, Fenway teammates, Matt Ketseth in the 17, Greg Biffle in the 16, they have the same problem. They both have gotten loose. They both are going to make the same adjustment. Air pressure for the 16 and the 17. Biffle has to back his car up a little bit. Let's go to Matt. Johnson said the changes he made on the last stop, it did not help his bigger issue, and then it really killed the car on exit, made it way too free. Big chassis adjustment, Dick. Now Gordon has been told the crew is going to get it done. They're going to get him out of the pits first. That's what's most important. So far, so good. There goes Gordon. Here comes the 17 on the outside. And Matt Kenseth and his killer bees once again win the race off pit road. Tell you what, Steve Addington, the 18 right. crew, they had a great pit stop. Got him up to third. Kyle Busch. And how about Denny Hamlin, the 11 car? They've cracked the top five. I think if I was uh, 17 or the 24, I'd be worried about the 18 right now. Now the big loser on this round of pit stops, Greg Biffle. Let's see what happened as the 16 came in and whipped to a stop. Oh, ran over the air hose. Got to get, got to go back. Yep. You can see that they were concerned about him being over the line, but the concern was the front tires, were, they, it was on the air hose. The guy just didn't get it whipped out there far enough. You're supposed to whip it out far enough where the car will not run over it. He didn't get it around in front of the car far enough. Now the thumbs up that the NASCAR official gave was that you are in your box. Test it up. Yeah. Daryl. Yeah, buddy. Look at the thing. The driver went over the mark where he's supposed to stop. It's the driver's fault. Don't blame the tire changer. Look at it. He threw it way out in front. Greg slid almost out of his pits. By half a car length, he missed where the sign was. Watch, buddy. See the orange tape right there? That's where he's supposed to put that left front. In fact, the left rear ended up there. So Jeff's really exactly right. Must be one of it must be one of Hammond's trainees. <laughs> and you know, there's there's no one pitted in front of Biffle. He has the opening to the garage area just, the, just in front of him. Everybody's trying to beat the 17 out of the pit. Right. So you get in and get out as quick as you can. Good bit of speedy dry down on the racetrack. 40 laps to go. David Stremme did not pit. Posted, he's posted as the leader. All right, boys, we got a good race car. It's a long race. It's a uh, work hard all day long. I'll be there at the end. Get out there. Get to the wall. Get to the wall. Here they come. They're going to be outside you. Inside. Nice and easy. Clear low. Clear behind the 88 if you need it. Good up on the big screen there, buddy. Welcome back live, NASCAR on Fox, and that is Kevin Harvick's car with the right front tire problem, 39 laps to go, and under caution, the pit stops we saw moments ago, Matt Kenseth actually picking up a couple of spots, nine spots lost from Greg Biffle and that miscue running over the air hose. Yeah, those guys right there, those killer bees, I mean, they've been solid all year long so far. I think they've helped win him the Daytona 500, and tonight they're keeping him up front and putting him in a place to where he can possibly hold off Jeff Gordon, maybe for two wins in a row. I'm not sure who keeps these stats, but... Uh, Right, 10 spots tonight they picked up. They've gained that crew of Matt Kenseth. And we keep talking about how important it is. There they are. They're sitting down there right now. They know they've done a good job. Now they're going to have their driver to settle it on the racetrack. Jeff's picks for today's AT&T fastest pick crew are as follows. The 17, the 24 of uh, Jeff Gordon, also Kurt Busch's crew. Don't forget to vote the AT&T fastest and most valuable pick crew of the year. From your AT&T phone, text the pick crew's car number to 2258 to vote. Let's do a quick recap here before we get going and go back to green. Matt Kenseth, who came in as the points leader of that Daytona 500 win on the restart here, lap 176, protects the lead against Greg Biffle, his teammate. Kenseth actually had some debris on the front. Look how he wises uh, during a caution, wisely uses the pace car to get rid of that. Jeff Gordon taking the lead with 54 laps to go. Gordon and Jimmy Johnson leading the most laps so far. Engine trouble, sending Junior to the garage. Kevin Harvick. Running in the top 10, some problems through much of the evening here. Right front tire into the wall. He was okay. 
and, and Chris, I'm not too sure about what happened to Kevin, but you can see here clearly what happened to Greg Biffle. He ran past his signboard and ran over the front airline, had to back up, and it cost him nine spots on pit road. Now he's really going to get up on the wheel if he wants to make a run for the win. And so, Kenseth, as we cycle back through your leader with Jeff Gordon, you have Kyle Busch in the hunt trying for that historic weekend. Yeah, a lot of things could happen here, but I want to go back to Kevin Harvick, who may be ending his consecutive uh, finishing streak there. To me, a lot of oil coming out underneath that car, both sides, before he got into the, into the uh, outside safer barrier, and we just have been con confirmed from our folks on pit road, Matt Yoakum says the 29 car did lose an engine before he hit that outside safer barrier, so it wasn't a right front tire. Here's another guy that's in the garage area right now because of an engine-related situation, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and that number 88 Hendrick ride. And frustrated in Fontana for Jr. Again, in February, he had engine problems, finished 40th in the uh, 2007 and 09 February races here, so the engine, in fact, didn't Greg Biffle uh, last February, uh, he was the leader much of the race, and uh, he also had engine problems and wound up a 42nd, led 168 laps uh, a couple of years ago here in uh, February. And let's uh, rejoin Daryl, Larry, and Mike upstairs. They're uh, adding brake fluid to that 26 is what they're doing there. Yeah, because, Matt, this is still a car that's on the lead lap. When he hit pit road the first time, Larry Mack, he was top 10 running in the ninth position. They're trying to diagnose what area of the brakes that have failed and the fronts are locking up, so they're leaning more toward that they've lost the pedal as far as the rear go, adding brake fluid his fifth time now on pit road. One to go. And this race will have 35 laps to run when we get the green flag as McMurray pulls out. David Stremme made a really sharp strategy move. Remember on the last caution period when Tony Stewart and others stopped with one lap before the green. David Stremme was one of those. So on this caution period, he was able to stay out in case the rains came. Stremme would have been the winner. Now with one lap to go, he pulls in to get his fuel and make what he hopes will be his final pit stop. And just to follow up on the 29 car, if we re looked at the replay, you could see parts flying out from under the car. Uh, so definitely had an engine. I wonder why, if it was a tire, he threw his helmet off and got out of the car, yeah. that they would have towed it in and tried to got it back, gotten it back in the race. So the Auto Club 500 set to restart with just 35 laps to go. Well, I'll tell you, Kenseth has a good car, Jeff Gordon has a good car, but we're going to keep a close watch on that little green machine back there in third. Kyle Busch in the 18 car trying to make history by winning all three races here this weekend. Reminds me of that movie Jaws. Dun, dun. <laughs> dun, dun. That's funny because you remind a lot of people <laughs> of the movie Jaws, starting with Cale Yarborough. I love it. I love it when you look back in the mirror and you say, now, where did he come from? <laughs> right. <laughs> This restart's going to be so important for all these cars because that's where Kenseth has been so strong getting out of the box on the restart. 16 cars on the lead lap for this restart. Next Sunday, Las Vegas, two weeks, Atlanta, as NASCAR on Fox rolls on. All right, let's get ready to go. 35 laps. They can make it from here on fuel. Let's see what happens. As Matt Kenseth, Daytona 500 winner, brings them down for the restart. Got to watch that uh, stage ride down in that first turn. It's like everybody's going to get through okay. Just a little dust flying. A little wiggle from Kyle Busch there in third. Yeah, Kyle picked the throttle up early in one and two, but he had to backpedal just a little bit late exit. That's the reason Jeff Gordon in the 24 pulled away from him. Krista. In the garage with Dale Earnhardt Jr., he was um, talking with crew chief Tony Urie Jr., director of competition, Doug Ducart, your engine guy, Scott Maxim. 200 cars up front, 200 cars in the garage. What happened? Well, I think uh, we broke something in the valve train probably uh, spring first. But um, we had a great car. I'm, you know, we never have engine trouble. This is the first time I've really had any. And... Uh, it's a little frustrating, but they, you know, the motors are great and they got so much power. And I'm sure it's just an anomaly, and they'll figure out what it was, and it won't never happen again. But we were struggling a little bit, but uh, we were kind of making our way up through there. I felt like we definitely had a shot of finishing inside the top ten. If we got lucky, we might have been able to finish fifth or so. Did they fill you in on Mark Martin? Was it the same issue? Well, I mean, yeah, it probably is. <laughs> both of us, had, both of them happened at the same time. His his broke a spring and a valve, probably the spring first, but. 
you know, we was out there running and we lost another spring and and we was running too slow to end. So, you know, it was a little dangerous in the way then. But um, I don't know. We had a pretty good car. Starting last was tough. We almost got lapped there early, but we were coming. Dale Earnhardt Jr. They changed transmissions. He had to go to the back and start last. But I agree with him. They definitely had made huge gains on that race car. Oh, yeah. He'd gotten up to, I think he was in the top 10 right there just before he had trouble. Seeing the same thing on this restart we've seen on the last one. 17 car shoots out there to a pretty nice lead. Then Gordon gets his car kind of the tire pressures come up and he chases him down. Uh, maybe the only difference this time is that green car back there that's uh, lurking. I'm watching mid-pack, Daryl. Now, here, here's a couple of good battles. This one, Kurt Busch and Denny Hamlin for fourth place. Hamlin is Kyle Busch's teammate at Joe Gibbs Racing in that Toyota. And a little further back behind Jimmy Johnson in seventh, Tony Stewart and Brian Vickers. There's the old Spice car of Stewart trying to make his way back up toward the front. I think the two cars that really impressed me the most tonight for the run he's had. But remember, too, that's a Penske is the only Dodge team, I think, Larry, correct me if I'm wrong, that's running the new Dodge engine here this weekend. To my knowledge, they are that their whole group, Stremme, uh, Sam Hornish Jr., and Kurt Busch. Stewart moves past the lap car of Boyer, and Kurt Busch had an anxious moment. Coming off turn four. There's a look at Bush live. And here's what happened. Car just stepped out with him late exit of turn four. That's just uh, that's that push loose thing. You got a lot of wheel in it, under power, and all of a sudden the front digs in and the back snaps around. 30 laps to go. Matt Kenseth is stepping it out from Jeff Gordon. And now David Reagan, we were looking at him in that six car. He's the first car one lap down back in the 17th spot. But, you, you know, Mike, when I look at those top three cars, you know, starting with Kyle Busch in the 18 car, we've, always, we've already talked about and documented what he's trying to accomplish. But then you look at Jeff Gordon. He's not won a race since October of 2007 in that 24 car. But then the guy that's in front of him leading this race, only once in the last 32 years has a guy won the first two races of the season, and it was Jeff Gordon that did it in 1997 when he won Daytona and Rockingham. So the stories with those three cars, there's a lot of, of incentive for those guys to win this race. But right? putting Matt Kenseth in that same category, he didn't win a race last year either. And look how he's starting this year off. I mean, what a turnaround from a year ago. Steve is in the leader's bid. Mike, before the restart, Matt Kenseth asked Drew Blickensdurfer, he said, how close am I on fuel? And Blickensdurfer said, real close. And Matt said, how close am I on fuel? And he said, uh, we'll be okay if it's a green-white checker. Cut her loose. Oh, I think we're good to go oh, yeah. on fuel. I don't think fuel will be a problem. And, and I, I like to, I, I like Drew. I think he's a great guy. He's obviously a very smart crew chief, but he's going to be Blick in my book. <laughs> they call his dad Blick. His dad's a coach up in Indiana, I think, and uh, they call him Blick. I think he ought to be Blick. Well, speaking of Blick, this is only his second start as a NASCAR Sprint Cup Series crew chief. He's batting 1,000 coming in here tonight. He's trying to really bat 1,000 leaving here. Only three drivers since the Daytona 500. It's a little better, but I don't think it's going to be good enough. But it's a little bit better. Oh, Matt. Come on, cheer <laughs> up, Matt. <laughs> we since, hear that occasionally. <laughs> since the first Daytona 500 in 1959, only three drivers have won the 500 and gone on to win the next week. In 1973, Richard Petty won Daytona and won Richmond the following Sunday. In 1977, Cale Yarborough did the same thing. And in 1997, Jeff Gordon won the 500 and won at Rockingham one week later. Well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, the first two races didn't used to be uh, Daytona, Rockingham, Daytona, Richmond. No. They used to be Riverside, Riverside Side, California. And Daytona. The nine turn road course, that's right. We used to run there in mid January, yep. just a few miles from here. And then take a month off before Daytona. <laughs> It took us that long to get back. <laughs> <laughs> you load everybody up in my van and get back west or back east. Saw Joey Logano there, the young rookie, the 20 car back in the 28th spot. But I think doing what he needed to do tonight, he's only one lap down. That needs to be the goal of him and this race team, finish these races. If he keeps trying to match Tony Stewart's performance in that car, 
he's he's going to continue to have failure. He just needs to drive the car like Joey wants to drive it, and they need to work with him for a little while and give him a chance to get his feet under him. Carl Edwards, defending race winner, and Jimmy Johnson, who's won two of the last three. He's won the last two here. fall races. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. yep. But that's the way they finished one year ago. Jimmy Johnson chasing Carl Edwards to the finish line. In fact, last fall, Jimmy Johnson led 228 of 250 laps. Matt Kenseth, the leader. He's not getting away, but Jeff Gordon is not closing in. What kind of strategy? We'll find out in a minute. Here is your Daytona 500 winner, Matt Kenseth. Kenza trying for two in a row. Now, Daryl, he leads Jeff Gordon by half a second. There is Matt's wife, Katie, up on the pit box. And the gap has not grown larger. It's not grown smaller. With 22 laps to go, is it time or is it too soon for Jeff Gordon to be worrying too much about that deficit? This is exactly a replay of the last time we went green after a caution. The 17 shot out to a pretty comfortable lead. But then the 24 over the long run, the longer they went, the closer he got and the better he got. And that seems to be what's going to happen here. Yeah, last time by, Jeff Gordon beat Matt Kenseth by almost three tenths of a second that last lap. Two drivers who are both past champions of this series. Two drivers, neither of whom won a race all last year. Two drivers who have been dominant pretty much in these first two races. Well, this is the best. I, I believe overall this is the best race I've seen Jeff Gordon run in quite some time from start to finish. I've seen him fade at different times in races, but today he's been right there all day long. Now he finished 13th in the Daytona 500, but was up in the lead pack most all day until the rains came after winning his qualifying race on Thursday. This battle here will not go away between Carl Edwards in the 99, Jimmy Johnson in the 48. That's a battle for six. I'm sure those guys would love to get up to the top five before this thing's over with 21 laps to go. What Matt Kenseth needs to do, although leading this race, is not look back. Just keep hammer down, hammer down, and don't worry about where Jeff Gordon is. Matt has a tendency to start worrying about where somebody is late in these races. I saw Jeff Gordon spin him out at uh, Chicago, I think, a couple of years ago. And, uh, and the man just needs to forget about it. Jeff Gordon and drive his own race and drive hard. Boy, Gordon gets off a of turn two so good. He has all night long. They always told me when you're looking back, you're losing time. That lap, Jeff Gordon cut Kenseth's lead in half. Yeah, I believe he's coming. Well, he's going to put it. Uh, he's going to go down on the apron and drive right up under him. Looks like that's what his plan is. And we're getting a report that Matt Kenseth has complained about his car getting loose, which means he can't put the throttle down and get off the corner. That's where Gordon has the advantage. Kind of tip for tat here. They look like they both get through this end pretty good. But the other ends where Jeff is better. Jeff drops that thing down on the apron in uh, three and four and Matt can't stop him. In 1992, Jeff Gordon was the California kid. He has since won four championships in this series, but he is trying to rebound from a winless 08. I mean, he's trying every groove there is right now around this two mile racetrack. And, and the, the thing about this car is it takes a lot of discipline to drive yeah. this car. If you overdrive it, you get anxious, drive in too hard, get back in the gas too quickly, you lose time. You got to time your every move in this car just right. Now Kyle Busch is third. He is four seconds behind running all by himself and called into his crew and says, I don't know what to do. Can't go forward, can't go <laughs> no, back. No, no, no. He hadn't been behind anybody for two days. He doesn't <laughs> know what to do. Definitely That's a true. different position for him this weekend. And his teammate Danny Hamlin now fourth. Kurt Busch now fifth. Still with 16 cars on the lead lap. 18 laps to go. There's the two crew chiefs, Steve Latart on the left, Drew Blickensdurfer going for his second win in a row on the right. I believe that Jeff Gordon has the best car, Larry. I believe he's better than Matt, but he can't get in a position to get by him. And I think when he gets outside of him, like it, or the air off of uh, Matt's car is taking the front grip away from the 24 and he can't make the pass. And that's what crew chief Steve Latart told Jeff during one of the cautions. Don't worry about pit road. You've got the best car here out on the racetrack. Go get him. You see, they changed. Now, Matt's down on the bottom. 
And, uh, and Jeff tries the high line. Let's see how they come off turn four here and see how that works out. About the same. <laughs> not much difference. I mean, their lap times are not varying from each other. 85, 41.85 to a 41.84. But, but boy, that lap there, Matt Kenseth really pulled away from Jeff Gordon. Yeah, he brought that lead back up to six tenths of a second, the most it's been in 10 or so laps. Well, here's what you want to do if you're leading this race. At some point, and this might be the point, you want to tell Jeff Gordon, you can give up. You might as well quit. You're not going to beat me. I've got some in reserve, and you just keep, you can hammer all you want to, but I'm going to beat you. Clear by seven means you have a seven car length lead and opening it up. And, it, and, and Jeff Gordon sitting there thinking, well, I don't want to make a mistake. I am running second. So if Matt's that much better than I am, or if he's going to drive off and leave me, I might as well cool my jets. And that, la that lead is now up to eight tenths of a second. Is Jeff Gordon cooling his tires and waiting a bit? There's 15 laps to go. There's still plenty of time. Well, that's a sly old fox, you know. You'll kind of fall back off a guy and make him think, okay, you got me beaten, I give. And then all of a sudden you turn on the afterburner. There'll be a 14 to go when you get here. And you just wonder at that run he was making a few laps ago if maybe he overheated that right front tire and now he's having to cool it a little bit. That may bit. be all he has. And the reason I said you're probably right, Larry, watch him in one and two. Jeff Gordon seems to be shy, sliding up the hill in one and two. But as we've seen in each of these long green flag runs, the longer we run, the better Jeff Gordon's car gets relative to the field. But he's much higher in this turn than he has been. Okay. Uh, looks like the car, now you see him wiggle off of that turn. I believe Jeff has maybe used his stuff up, but I think he's got a run left in him. When I think there's about five or six to go, he's going to give it all he's got. Well, and he has nothing to lose because he has a four-second lead over third-place Kyle Busch in the 18. Might as well make a run for it. He's not worried about protecting right now. This is great racing, though. This is two really great drivers, and both of them need a win. Of course, Matt's already got his. Jeff needs his worse. But neither one of them, they're waiting for the other one to make a mistake. And it's very rarely even the one of them makes a mistake. These two guys are probably the two drivers of all the ones in the field that are mistake-free most of the time. Boy, Matt got a big push up off of two that time. But Jeff Gordon closed in by two-tenths. Yeah, well, I think Matt was yep. really sliding up the hill coming out of the turn that time. Matt Kenseth has been described as robotic. In yeah. fact, Sprint did a commercial where they took one broken Matt Kenseth robot away and brought in another one to finish the commercial as uh, Greg Biffle makes the run for seventh I on Jimmy it. Johnson. And Matt kind of laughs that off. He says, yeah, I'm not an emotional guy. I, I don't show a lot of emotion except for last Sunday. I never saw a robot cry. That's right. <laughs> and he did after winning the 500. Go get him. But just think about Greg Biffle as he just dr drove by Jimmy Johnson in that 48. He's still trying to overcome the mistake he made overshooting his pit stop sign a while ago. I think Jeff Gordon's used his tires up, Larry. i tell you why. I've seen him wiggle really hard a couple of times the last lap or two. Like when he gets back in the gas, he doesn't have any right front tire left. Thing is pushing loose. And the thing about Matt Kenseth, as long as is Mike Kalanoff is spotter, or he can look at that mirror and see the 24 fading, then he can kind of run his pace. He don't have to overextend that 17 car. 11 laps Eight. to go. He's a flat. Point eight up. 41.8 seconds for Kenseth, a flat. 42 seconds flat for Jeff Gordon. See how high Gordon gets really. That's just higher off of that turn and he's been. Now he's going to pick up some speed out of there, but the, the last couple of times he's wiggled out of there when he's gotten that high. You know, look, to go here. look back at 2008, even though the 24 car went winless, you could tell in those 10 chase races that those guys were beginning to figure this new car out. They had some great runs, uh, some great finishes, and I think they're starting 2009 on that momentum they built in those 10 chase races. Matt lost, Matt lost a little time off of four that time. And they're just trading. I mean, one lap, it's uh, Kent is a little quicker. The next lap, Gordon's a little quicker. Jeff just keeps getting higher and higher. I, I, I think that's just a product of the car. Seeing he's wiggling now a little bit back there. But I'm like you, Daryl. He's not. He's going to go down. He's swing. not done yet. He's got one more run in him. And the two of them are racing away from the field. Kyle Busch is now six seconds back in third. They're a couple of tenths faster than those guys back there in yep. third and fourth. 
Look at the interval back to third place. Here he comes. First time I missed one and two in a while. Denny Hamlin, there's fourth, and Kurt Busch fifth. Carl Edwards sixth with Greg Biffle. Jimmy Johnson. See, Jeff, is, uh, there's something. That car has lost the right front tire. He just keeps getting higher and higher. Either that or he's either that or he's looking for a groove that nobody's found up there. Greg Biffle continues his march back to the front. He gets by his teammate Carl Edwards in the 99. That'll move him up to the sixth spot. With but nine he, laps to go. But he's going to have to wonder what might have been if he'd had a clean stop on that last tire change. Good off the bus. Eight to go. 13. He's a 15. That time by a 14 to a 16. Those two lead cars. Just even. They're just almost dead even. Denny Hamlin takes over fourth. Today's Sprint Monster Mobile Moment. That would be Matt Kenseth winning the race off pit road. And, 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 and Jeff Gordon knew this. Jeff Gordon knew that he was, if he was going to win this race, he had to get in front of that 17 off of pit road. About one second the difference between those two cars there and about one second the difference between those two cars out on the racetrack with seven to go. Boy, what you don't want now if you're Matt Kenseth is, is a caution. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Eric well, Alma rolling the eight car down on like the eight on, has engine problems. Remember, that's an ECR engine, which certainly builds the engines for the 29 car of Harvick that blew up earlier. Down on the apron out of harm's way. We should be we should be clean and green here. I don't think we're going to get a caution. Jeff Gordon has knocked two tenths of a second out of Kansas lead with six to go at that pace they'll be side by side at the white flag Jeff Gordon if he'll run that apron if he'll get down on that apron in three and four that's where he is so much better than Matt Kenseth and I'm not sure what he's doing in one and two I'm not sure if he's running way up high like that right there because he's found something or the cars the tires have come off of the car but it appears Larry the way he accelerates out of this hole right here he may have found something but Daryl look at the run he got I think that's the reason he went high through one and two he got that great hole shot out of turn two now drive it on the apron put it on the apron that's where you're the best and that's what he's doing right here they'll be coming to five laps to go this time smoking those tires through the middle of the corner Jeff Gordon trying to get his first sprint cup point win in over a year five laps to go and the margin six tenths of a second and, and let me tell you both of those guys heart rate are raised up way higher they've been all night long and let's look at the run he gets this time off turn two Kenseth all the way to the bottom it's a little treacherous when you get up there you can't miss it he wiggled a little that time that's all right you want the short way around or the fast way around well that's it down around the bottom short up around the top fast but this is the end where Jeff makes up the time when he puts that car down on that apron he really picks up time on Matt. And he got it way down on there that time. Now there are some lap cars out in front of our leader, Matt Kenseth, in the 17 right now. Four to go. Yeah, and that 71 car is right in Matt's way. I, he cleared him okay. Yep, David Gilliland. And clear the top all clear. Four to go. Boy, uh, Matt put a bunch of distance on uh, on Jeff that time. Uh, Daryl, it's almost like Jeff made one more run at it, and it's just not there right now. I think when he had to start, I know he's making time up high, but I don't think he wanted to be up there and wanted to. Nine tenths of a second, Kansas lead, and that right front tire is smoking on that 24 car, which means she's about gone. <laughs> That's right, and it means he's cranking on it too. Kyle Busch seven seconds back. Greg Biffle has moved to fourth. Come on, man, get out of the you way. You wonder what might have been for Biffle, but looks like he's going to have to settle for fourth place. Yeah, he's definitely faster than those cars up front, but I think it's going to be to no avail as next time by they'll be coming to two to go. There's Kyle Busch in green, and there's Biffle in white. Yeah, he'll have his work yep. cut out for him just to try to get up to Kyle Busch, which I don't think yep. will happen in two and a half laps. Well, you can see now that Matt has really pulled away from Jeff Gordon. He got a lap yep. car in between him now. Uh, it's going to take some. It's going to take a big mistake on uh, Kenseth's part in the 17 car now for Jeff to get to him.
Matt has a fairly clean racetrack in front of him now. For two to go. I'm just really impressed with the way Matt has sat there and not made a mistake. He's run that same line ever since we went back to green. And remember, he said on the radio, I don't think we've got the car. I don't think we can do it. Yeah, he says that <laughs> every now and then. <laughs> yeah, he's got a very comfortable lead with uh, coming to the, what are we coming to white this time? White flag this time. Very comfortable. And Jeff is smoking the tires now. Matt Kenseth started 24, right, so which is about average starting position <laughs> yeah, for him yeah. here. That's a plus for him, actually. One second, bring it home, bud. Wow. Two in a row, Larry. How about that? And uh, how about Drew Blick? The He'll Blick. still batting 1,000. The Blick. My new hero. We're by 12. Jeff Burton just ahead, a former teammate of Kenseth Come at Roush Racing. Time. I'm real impressed with the way these guys have gotten out of Matt's way. A couple of cars have just kind of stayed in the groove, but it doesn't matter. He's going to get by. And here he comes. Matt Kenseth. Only the fourth driver in NASCAR history to win the Daytona 500 and the next race. Checkered flag, third California win for Kenseth and Roush Fenway Racing and Ford. How about that 17 car? How about those boys? Celebrate the good times. Yeah, yeah baby. And just think, Matt, you don't have to go coast to coast to coast today. <laughs> don't have to go home and get clothes. <laughs> Steve. And Mike, Drew Blickensdurfer celebrating atop the pit box. And Drew, two races, two wins as a Sprint Cup Series crew chief. Congratulations. Thanks, guys. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be uh, associated with the Walton and Carl Hart and Matt Kenseth in the 17 car. These guys are awesome. They're the best in the business. So uh, it's, it's, it's a real privilege. All right, congratulations. Two for two. Jack Roush has now won the last five February races at Auto Club Speedway. Victory Lane next. Welcome to the Lipitor Post Race Show. Matt Kenseth led 84 laps, the most of any driver, including the final 38 to win the second race of 2009. He is two for two. He's the fifth driver in NASCAR history to win the first two races of the season. And Dick Bergeron is with Kenseth in for victory lane. Sport. And most of all, thanks for all the fans for watching. It's awesome. Congratulations to you, Kristen. Wow. <laughs> after not <laughs> after not winning all of last year, how have you pulled off two in a row? It's these guys behind me, man. I'm uh, so blessed. I got such a uh, such a great race team. I need to have my son Ross, man. I know he, uh, him and dad both missed uh, missed two in a row here, but I uh, just thank these guys. They gave me the pit stop and got me the clean air, and that's just a, a huge uh, huge difference. Uh, so. Anyway, I need to thank uh, Carhartt for being on board and DeWalt, USG Sheetrock, RNL Carriers, Ford Fusion, and also thank you Sprint for all their support. And most of all, thanks for all the fans for watching. It's awesome. Hey, congratulations to you. Krista? The first thing car owner Rick Hendricks said to Jeff Gordon is, I can see it in your eyes. You guys are going to win some races this year. Talk about your run. Well, we certainly are if we keep putting DuPont Chevrolets out there on the track like we did tonight. It was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, this team is just, this is a new team, and they showed it tonight. Um, you know, we still got a little bit of work to do, but, uh, man, I, I, I'm so excited on one side because we ran so good, and we have started off the season so great. But I'm so mad on the other because uh, I felt like we had what it took to win tonight. You know, Matt Kenseth, you got to give those guys a lot of credit on that 17 team. They had great pit stops, but they adjusted there and made his car a little bit better. And we made an adjustment that made mine a little bit too tight. And when I caught him, I just I just couldn't do anything with him. He, he drove a great race, didn't make any mistakes. And um, so, you know, we, we, it's bittersweet, but we got to come away with this uh, with a lot of positive feelings because, uh, Man, we're a long ways ahead of where we were at this time last year, I feel like. And uh, I'm, I'm pumped. I'm really excited about this, uh, this whole season. Got to thank DuPont, National Guard, Pepsi, Quaker State, uh, Chevrolet, everybody, uh, all these fans that, uh, that watched at home and came out here. It was a heck of a race, and we're proud to finish second. Jeff said we're going to get them, boys. Steve? 
Well, Krista, with Greg Biffle and uh, Greg, classy move by you. I heard you apologize to your team on the cool down lap for sliding through your pit stall. And they should fire me. I can't believe, uh, I just, I still can't believe I took a car that fast and finished fourth with it. Uh, I'm so proud of them of giving me that, that kind of race car. They worked really, really hard and I let them down. And uh, I'm gonna try not to do that the rest of the year. Thank you, Greg. Thanks. Matt. At a first, first and third for Kyle Busch, how would you describe in Kyle Busch terms, your less than stellar performance after two wins. Yeah. Really good run tonight, though, for you. It was. It was less than stellar, that's for sure. Thanks, Matt. Uh, you know, tonight was a good run for us. You know, I'm really proud of the whole Interstate Batteries team, M&M's, Toyota, TRD, all the guys that uh, that worked so hard on this team this weekend. You know, they did a flawless job just trying to prepare the car and, and get me there, at least give me a shot for it. But, man, the 17 and 24 were just so strong. It looked like the 18 and the 51 from yesterday, you know, as, as far ahead as they were from us, and we were finishing third. So, um, just a tough break, but uh, you know we'll go to Vegas. Hopefully, we can have a strong run there. We got a rebound from last week, so that was a good start to that. Stellar run for Kyle Busch, third here in Fontana. Mike, for me, Daryl, the enduring image of tonight is that when Jeff Gordon filled up his rearview mirror, Matt Kenseth never wavered. He didn't. He never made a mistake. But you know what? I'm taking away from this weekend. It's a record-breaking or record-tying weekend. Kyle Busch yesterday went in both races. Matt Kenseth comes back today with back-to-back -to -back wins. What a great crowd here tonight, and what an exciting finish to the race, Larry. I had a great time. How about you? I mean, that part's what I'm taking away, Daryl. All the doom and gloom that we've read and seen over the winter, and we come here, and to see these fans standing on their feet after 500 miles of racing, and to see Jeff Gordon and Matt Kenseth up there going after it. But how about Drew Blickensdurfer? He's batting a thousand. In fact, his last four trips to the racetrack, he's been to Victory Lane. He won the last two Nationwide Series races last year with Carl Edwards. So he's the man for the pit box. The Blick. <laughs> the Blick is the man. Look at that great celebration down <laughs> in Victory Lane. Lots more to come from Auto Club Speedway. Stay with us. Back live, NASCAR on Fox, Jeff Hammond, Chris Myers, and Matt Kenseth, the sequel, another smash win. He has a chance to do something that's never been done before in the 61-year history of NASCAR. That's win the first three races of the season next week in Vegas, where he's won twice. Check out the results here as he held off Jeff Gordon, Kyle Busch, and Greg Biffle. Yeah, Pitt Road, I think, really had a determining factor tonight. The 17 crew, outstanding. His teammate, Greg Biffle, makes a mis miscue. He winds up coming in fourth. Well, that was a good and a bad. Clean air, hard to find in L.A., but he said he found it, and he thanked his pit crew, which was a difference, of course. So the Wisconsin native, back-to-back -back wins as we complete the results. Your points leader after the first two weeks, and again, heading to Vegas where he's won twice yeah, in his career. Yeah, he's twice right now. He's really looking strong. We look there up behind him, Jeff Gordon. He's trying to get back into victory lane. Tony Stewart, man, new team, third in points already early in the season. Coming up tonight on Fox, and we thank you for watching NASCAR on Fox. Stay tuned for late local news, except on the West Coast. Next week, we'll be in Las Vegas. Note the start time, 3.30 Eastern. 12.30 Pacific, see who can uh, catch maybe one of the Las Vegas natives, Kyle Busch or Kurt Busch, and that was the story of the weekend until tonight was Kyle Busch. Or if one of the other drivers, Jeff Gordon, could end his non-winning streak. Our thanks to the entire crew. By the way, happy birthday to our senior video operator, Gene Michael, turned 70 on Tuesday. We wish him a good one. Thank him for all his hard work on our crew. Jeff Hammond needs to head to a, a tanning booth. We thank you for tuning in here. You can't figure this thing out. First two weeks, Matt Kenseth after not winning a race all of last year. Thanks for watching NASCAR on Fox. Promotional consideration paid for by these fine folks. Awesome, buddy. Awesome.